good, beautiful, but early morning from Magic Kingdom Fresh Baked. Welcome to another episode of Fresh Baked and Stuff here at Magic Kingdom. I am your host, Laramie Williams, and you guys, this is fantastic. First of all, look at this, there's no one here because it's so stinking early. It's like 6.30. No, that's not true. It's, it's like 7.15. But um, I'm here to take the Magic Behind Our Streams Steam Trains tour with, uh, with this group of fine people right here. And I'm very excited, you guys. It's, it's possible for me to take this behind the stage tour, behind the scenes tour, rather, of backstage. Behind the backstage scenes tour. Okay, well, you get the idea. <laughs> It's possible because of all the muffins, because you guys are fantastic. Everyone that's uh, been keeping the show going and supporting me through my Patreon campaign at patreon.com forward slash Laramie Williams uh, has made this tour possible. So thank you guys so much. And uh, it's, it's going to be a good day, you guys. We're going to, they encourage videotaping. So it's going to be really, really cool. I just hope you guys get to hear everything. So that's, that's the big thing. But, uh, ooh, speaking of trains, look, here it comes. Here it comes. Somewhere. It's behind the building. There we go. Yay. I don't really have any idea what to expect, you guys. It's going to be a lot of fun to, uh, to uh, take this tour. Yeah, so we're going to learn about the trains, which is Walt's favorite. So, ooh, I'm filming. <laughs> I'm filming! <laughs> so, the, I, it's gonna be super cool, you guys, but I better go join this tour group now. He's giving me instructions on what to do, so I'll be right back with ya! Yay, look at this, you guys! This is so cool! I got a, a nifty little uh, a pin, a special pin with my name on it. The magic behind our steam trains. It's gonna be a lot of fun, you guys. So, apparently, uh, there's gonna be earbuds with audio, um, so... Pretty much what I'm going to have to do to make sure you guys get to see this is just stay right up front by our tour guide, who it looks like his name's Taylor, and uh, hopefully you guys will be able to hear everything. But um, yeah, I think either way you're going to get to see some fun stuff, and with the magic of editing, David will narrow down this two and a half hour tour <laughs> to stuff you guys can watch and are interested in, but I, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, you guys. Uh, before we get started, let's set up those headsets. Go ahead and open up the pouch. You're gonna see an earpiece in the pouch. I'm gonna ask you to go ahead and put that earpiece on. It is probably the most difficult portion of your tour. <laughs> it's gonna hook over your entire ear with the wire pointing towards the back side of your head. Just like that. <laughs> I told you, this is the most difficult part of the tour. It's all downhill from here. Got it on. Okay. Yes, there we go. Okay. Inside the pouch, you'll see a device. The device has two little knobs on it. The first knob is a vertical tower. That should already be set to the number three. If it is not, please make sure that it is currently set to the number three. The second thing that you want to look at is the little wheel on the top. That's the power and the volume. As you click that on and you turn the volume up, you should begin to hear my voice in your ear. Hopefully everyone can hear my voice in their ear. Yes? Good. Uh, so a few things to remember about these headsets. Number one, they're not perfect. They do have about a 25 to 30 foot range. Uh, number two, you're also the only person who's going to be hearing out of that earpiece. So please feel free to adjust the volume to be as loud or as soft as you would like to be. Sound good? Great. Excellent. Well, good morning once again, and welcome to Disney's The Magic Behind Our Steam Train Store. You all are in for a real treat today. Uh, this is one of the most fun tours that we have here at Walt Disney World, and it really caters to a lot of different people. I like to say that this group caters to about three different groups of people because of its wide spectrum. First group of people, people who absolutely love trains. How many of you fit into that group? Big train fans. Yeah, good. Second group of people that this caters to, people who love Disney history. How many of you here really love Disney history? Ooh. Yeah. Third group, people who really love people who really love trains or Disney history. How many of you fit into that group? <laughs> yes. Uh, this tour does have something for everybody. Hopefully if you find yourself in that third group at the end of the day this morning, you'll be in one of those first two groups as well. Uh, to say a little bit about myself, my name is Taylor. I've been working here at Walt Disney World for about six and a half years now. I am fortunate enough to be able to do a lot of different things here at Walt Disney World, including 
Magic Behind Our Steam Train Store. Uh, this is a very, very fun tour and a very interesting experience because you get to learn not just about our steam trains, but about the history of the man who's behind all of these steam trains, Walt Disney. The reason we have these trains here is because of Walt himself and his undying love for steam trains that he had throughout his entire life. And we're going to explore all of that today. But the trains are located inside the Magic Kingdom, so in order to do that, we need to go into the park. You all have your park tickets. Let's head in. Touch points. Steam train store. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the very first building that you see when you come into the Magic Kingdom. It's this one, the train station. A lot of people don't expect it to be the train station. They expect to see a castle when they first arrive at the Magic Kingdom. Nope. They get to see a train station instead. We'll talk a little bit about why we thematically chose to put a train station here at the entrance of the Magic Kingdom, at least on Main Street, uh, a little bit later on this morning. But the iconic building of the train station really does welcome everyone to the Magic Kingdom. In fact, this is probably one of the most photographed buildings in the world. Mickey floral in front of the Main Street train station. This is actually a scaled down version of a real train station out in Saratoga Springs, New York. Still exists today, although now it's a private residence. Uh, so pretty cool, living in an old train station, right? Imagine that. Uh, the reason this is scaled down is because we had to fit it here in the theme park. So how do we scale it down? Well, there's three windows on either side of the central window, or in the full-size thing, there would have actually been four windows on either side. That central window is pretty important as well. Take a look up at the central window. You'll see it says it's the railroad office, and the chief engineer is Walter E. Disney. Also got the slogan of the railroad there, keeping dreams on track. That is a very special window. It was not here when the Magic Kingdom opened. We installed that window on December 5th, 2001 to honor Walt Disney. December 5th, 2001. Anyone know why we did it on that specific day? Oh, no, not September 11th, no. December 5th, 2001. The anniversary of his birth? Yeah, not just any old anniversary of his birth. His 100th birthday. Walt's 100th birthday was December 5th, 2000, uh, excuse me, 2001. We installed that window on the train station for Walt's 100th birthday. For someone who loved trains throughout his entire life, why not give Walt a train window here on our train station? Now, as I mentioned earlier, the trains are inside the park, and right now we are not really inside the park. We need to get into the Magic Kingdom in order to see those trains. So follow me this way, and today, you all will be the very first guests of the day to enter the Magic Kingdom. <laughs> as you start running towards it, yes. Now, since you are the very first guests of the day to enter the park, what that means is that you will see it as though you never have before. It will be completely empty. Which means that you might see some things here on Main Street that don't belong here. Things like golf carts or pickup trucks or vehicles of some kind. If you see anything like that, please do not take any photographs or videos of that. But I think we should be clear at this point. But if we see any vehicles around, I'll ask that you please afraid to take any photographs of those vehicles. Yeah, I think we'll be good. Welcome to Main Street USA. Completely empty. Why is that building covered in plastic? Why is that building covered in plastic? Actually, We're doing some sort of restoration work on the facade of that building. So like, instead of putting... Fake. It does look fake. That's because it is. Instead of putting just an ugly brown tarp up there, we decided we'll put a picture up there of what the building should look like. Uh, you can go over here. You can take pictures if you want. Get your empty mainstream USA photos. Watch yourself on the curb. This is the only way you can get these pictures. Wow. There it is. There it is. You have never seen Main Street this empty before, have you? Feel free to go ahead and pose the statue as well. Who is it in that statue? That's not Walt. Roy. That's Roy. Yeah, that's Roy O. Disney. If you don't know who that is, we'll talk about him a little bit. How many of you know what a hidden Mickey is? Good. If you don't know what a hidden Mickey is, you have a hidden image of Mickey Mouse that we put all around the park. I'll point out to you a really fun example of a hidden Mickey here on the train station. It's kind of one of the positional hidden Mickeys though. You gotta be standing in just the right spot to see it. So if you're standing right about here, 
You can go ahead and take a look up at the train station itself. Take a look. Oh, up. hey! Uh, Somebody can see it right away. Yeah. Good. The light that's closest to us on the ceiling, as well as the two speakers closest to us on the ceiling. Above. That's awesome. The circles around those form a perfect Another example of oh, hidden wow. Mickey here on the train station. You can take a look along the roof line and all the different finials up there. I thought you were talking about that. Yeah. So you can look at the roof line, all the finials up there. In the negative space of each finial, you can see a little bit of the Which means that if the sun were shining right now, and we're shining at the right angle, we could actually have little hidden Mickey's of sunlight here on the train. All right. The train has arrived. We are about to board the train. You all have got to do something really cool this morning. You have to come into the park before it opens for guests. We're going to do something else that's really cool as well. You are going to ride a Disney attraction before the park is open. In a matter of 48 hours, I'll be on a train and a boat. A train and a boat? What about a car? Did you take the car? Yeah. How about a plane? Yeah. Cars, boats, trains, and planes, right? Yeah, but tomorrow is going to go. Tomorrow is the boat? Yeah. Boats, you can ride a boat today. We have, we have boats here today. We're going to head this way. We're going to be riding this morning with the conductor. Back to the train. Take a lot of teamwork to operate this train. You might think that it is the engineer and the fireman up at the front of the train that control everything. And while they do control the motion of the train, it is ultimately up to the conductor to tell them to go. The conductor is the boss of the train, even though he's all the way in the back. The way the conductor and the engineer and the fireman communicate is through a series of buzzers and through a series of whistles. There's a buzzer on the very back of the train that the conductor will be buzzing in a series of basically different patterns, whether they're long or short buzzers. That buzzer is going to sound in the cab of the train, and the buzzer will sound loudly in there, enough so the fireman and the engineer will be able to hear it, and they will respond using the whistle, usually with the same signal. Sometimes they might signal something different back if they see something that the conductor does not. But it's the constant communication back and forth between both ends of the train, between the conductor in the back and the engineer and the fireman up in the front that will allow this train to really move the way that it does. We're just waiting on them to sign off on all the daily paperwork and then we will be able to go ahead and board the train. Do you know how many steam trains we have here at Walt Disney World? How many? Five. Five? No? How many? Three. Four. 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 Right in the middle. Four. <laughs> we have four trains here at Walt Disney World. Does anyone know their names? Oh. oh. Go ahead. The Roy of The Royal Disney, yes. Yeah, good. That's our number four train. Um, which one is the Rock? Brogy. Yep, the Rock Reed Brogies. This one right here, number three train. And Louie Bell. Louie Bell's number two. You're going in order. This is good. Who's the number one? And the number two. Whose window's right outside? Yeah, the Walter E. Disney. Those are our four trains. We're going to hopefully be able to see three of the four today. Uh, one of them right now, the Walter, is actually not here at Walt Disney World. Uh, he is away somewhere getting some sort of maintenance work done. There he is, but he's not here. <laughs> uh, so hopefully we'll be able to see the other three today. We've already seen Roger. Now we'll just uh, hopefully be able to see Roy and Lily back I already saw Roy. You already saw Roy? Good. Good. That's a good thing. I think he's back at the Roundhouse right now. You saw Roy's statue. Huh? I also just noticed that you have a little in your hair. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't notice it. Can I see it? Look at that. Hey! <laughs> really now all of YouTube knows you have a hidden Mickey in your hair. <laughs> uh, take a look out of Main Street. They've let the guests in now, so you can go ahead and... So they've already, they've already gone ahead and just made it nice and crowded for everybody. So you really were the only people today to get that wonderful photo of the Christmas card, right? Train today is the Let's Go whistle. It's two shorts, two two. Remember that? Let's go. That's going to allow the train to move forward. So when the conductor has realized that the station is clear, everyone's on board, ready to go. Twice. Uh, since it's Roger and it's got a loud buzzer, you may actually hear buzz buzz even from all the way in the back. We're going to have to train this morning. Uh, you'll also then hear two short whistles, two two, and that'll be our cue to move from that lead. Uh, you'll hear a few other unique whistles as we move around the uh, railroad today. I'll be able to explain to, the, to you what those whistles are a little bit later on. We'll be 
journey, journey, journey across every single inch of the one and a half mile track of the Walker Fuel Railroad today. Including the port, there we go. Including the portion that most people do not take control of. It's going to be worth it. It's going to be our spur line back. Feel free to go ahead. Smaller children towards the inside, please. And so we generally have a nice little safety announcement that plays here. I say play, the conductor usually says it. Alright. Good morning, folks! Welcome aboard the Walt Disney World Railroad. For your safety, please remain seated, keeping all hands, arms, legs, and feet fully inside the train. And most of all, while you are with us, please have fun. I'll play that to the roundhouse. Wait, I just realized a few other hidden things. A few other hidden things? Where are you seeing them? Uh, we generally have a nice little safety announcement that plays here. I say play, the conductor usually says it. We use 80% original parts, so these are genuinely the antique thing, the real deal. You're about to hear a whistle that's unique, uh, so we'll hear it a few times on the railroad here today. It is our crossing whistle. We're going to blow it every time we reach some sort of big crossing for the years. Here's now. It's too long whistles, then a short whistle, then a long whistle. Since we like to alert everyone who's in that crossing that the train is coming, we remember that one by saying, Here comes the train! Now this is not a crossing for cars, this is in fact a crossing for something pretty unique to us here in the Magic Kingdom. Parade floats. This crossing right here is where parade floats will cross to get from that thing. We're hearing that whistle again in just a moment, we're going to pass another parade float crossing too. Before that we're going to go into a tunnel, it's a pretty important tunnel. It relates to a contraction that I'm sure a lot of you have been on Pirates of the Caribbean. How many of you been on Pirates of the Caribbean? That was two years after the railroad and the parks did. There wasn't enough room left inside the railroad tracks to put Pirates of the Caribbean. We built it out there in that building you see up ahead. That's where Pirates of the Caribbean is located. But you board Pirates of the Caribbean on this side of the railroad track, don't you? So how do you get into that building when you're riding the attraction? You have to cross the train tracks at some point, right? That's right, you go underneath it. Right now, we are above the drop in Pirates of the Caribbean. Right above the drop, when you go down the drop, it takes you under the train tracks and into that building. Oh, it's like a parade for the is coming up. And then we're about to pull into the Frontierland train station. We're going to see another hit as we go into the Frontierland train station because we're going to be going through Splash Mountain. So as we go through the finale scene of Splash Mountain, you're going to see a large riverboat. Look at about 2, 3 o'clock on that riverboat. In the sky, you're going to see a pink cloud that looks like Mickey Mouse lying down on his back. So we'll be over here on the side of the train. Frontierland Station. 
This is not the original Frontierland train station. The very first Frontierland train station was about where that second parade float crossing was, and it looked very similar to Main Street. Same architectural style, just a lot smaller, one story, and painted red. Well, in 1990, the demand for a water ride here at the United Kingdom grew to such a level that what we decided to do was build a Splash Mountain right where we have that train station. So we actually ended up demolishing it, and in 1992, when Splash Mountain opened, this train station opened as well. So this is the new Frontierland train station, and it better reflects the storyline of the up and coming Frontierland. That small western town gets this railroad props and goes on top of it. Brought to pass an attraction that highlights the importance of trains in the Old West, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. They use a fun piece of railroad equipment over here on the left hand side of our board. Look, you see a swing bridge. This bridge right here will actually rotate into position to allow the train to see the Big Thunder Mountain Roundhouse out into the attraction itself. We have a spring bridge here at the Magic Kingdom. The Walt Disney World Railroad has one as well. We are about to cross the spring bridge. It's one of the oldest pieces of our railroad. It comes from Hans Henry Flagler's railroad that ran up and down East Coast of Florida. The fun thing about this swing bridge is that it still works. We can still rotate this bridge out of the way. Why do we do that? We want to go Liberty Bell Riverboat. Whenever we need to do any maintenance to the Liberty Bell Riverboat, we will rotate that bridge out of the way. We'll drink the Liberty Bell right through there with the pieces of clearance on either side to get these dried out of the bridge. How do we rotate the bridge out of the way? We're going to take a giant key, we're going to put it through this huge crank, and we'll have cast the bridge come and turn that crank by hand for about four hours to uh -huh. rotate the bridge out of the way. Then we'll have to rotate it again another four hours for the bridge to rotate back into position. I mentioned the name earlier, Henry Flagler. Uh, that bridge did come from Henry Flagler's railroad. Has anyone ever heard of Henry Flagler before? Henry Flagler was a pioneer in railroading here in Florida. He had a dream of being able to take train to the Florida Keys eventually. He, did. he built a huge railway called the Florida East Coast Rail that ran up and down the peninsula and even all the way down to the east. A lot of the infrastructure that he created for these trains were eventually converted into the automobile infrastructure that we know today. Has anyone here ever driven down to the Keys before and crossed things like the Seven Mile Bridge? That was created for a railway track, now converted for automobiles. In fact, when you think about it, Henry Flagler is probably one of the three most important people in the history of the state of Florida. The first would have to be Ponce de Leon, who came and discovered Florida while he was looking for that lost mountain of view, which of course he never found. But he did quite literally put Florida on the map. That map was only expanded on many years later by Henry Flagler, when he developed the infrastructure that we still use in the state today. And that infrastructure led to the development of probably the third most important man in the history of the state of Florida, Walt Disney. He was flying up above the state, he saw the intersection of Interstate 4 and Sunshine State Parkway, and said, that's where I'm going to build my vacation kingdom. Which, in a way, kind of brings us full circle, just like the train, back to Ponce de Leon. We look that lost fountain of youth, right? Well, if you listen to Roy Disney's dedication of the Magic Kingdom, this is a place for the young and heart of all ages to laugh and play and learn together. Everyone is a child here at Walt Disney World. We all sort of forget the cares of the real world. So in a way, maybe this is that lost stop in the youth that Ponce de Leon was looking for all those many years ago. We're on a portion of the railroad now that we call the back stretch. This is the longest straightaway portion of the track. It's also slightly downhill, which is why you might need to break the connection. We've got to make sure that we stay under our speed limit of 10 miles an hour. If we go above 10 miles an hour, an overspeed alarm is going to go off. There's only one way to turn off that overspeed alarm. You've got to call in maintenance and management. We just heard a few unique whistles, including the junction whistle. Two long whistles followed by a short whistle. That is two becoming one. We blow that whistle every time we approach a junction here at Walt Disney World, such as this one. This is the only junction we have on the, on the Walt Disney World Railroad. Yeah. We're the main line that we're traveling on right now. It's the spur line of the Walt Disney World Railroad. Yeah. We will be traveling down the spur line in this moment to head to the roundhouse. The other whistle that you heard was our station whistle. One long whistle followed by a short whistle. Remember that one by saying, we're here. We'll blow that whistle every time we arrive at a station, such as this one, the Fantasyland Station. That red, or excuse me, that yellow and green place that you see back there is the track switch. In just a moment, we'll have a maintenance cast member come out and throw that track switch to take us back to the roundhouse facility. Which means that not only do you get to come in the park before anyone else today, not only do you get to ride something here in the park before it opens today, but you're also about to do something else that's pretty cool. You're going to be riding the Walt Disney World Railroad backwards. Good morning! 
Uh, now I do mention at this point we are entering the only photosensitive corridor of the tour. So from the moment we start moving backwards until the moment we get off the train at the roundhouse, no photographs or video of any kind. We're going to talk all about it in just a second. And there's a little one in there. Yeah, so we didn't get to see three of them today. All right. And this train's gonna back up to the proper staging location for us to be able to explore a little bit later on today. But go ahead and take a look at the roundhouse. First thing you may notice about this roundhouse is it ain't round, right? Uh, most usually, most usual traditional roundhouses are built round uh, with a large turntable in them. The reason we would have a large turntable there is so that we can go ahead and rotate these trains and get them coupled up to whichever set of cars they need to be coupled up to. However, here, since we only have four locomotives and we knew we were only gonna have five bays in the roundhouse. We don't need to build a round one. We also have to store it a square roundhouse to store everything. In addition, we can also use it to serve as the monorail stuff. We have facilities to service 10 of our 12 monorails up above the train uh, roundhouse. 10 of them will stay inside there overnight. The other two will be parked out of the train overnight. We'll rotate those three out so that those three can stay out overnight. Nice and There's a few fun features about our roundhouse as well. Uh, you'll notice when we get a little bit closer to it, there's a large vent in place that's located right above where the locomotive sits. The reason that vent is in place is because we actually fire up the train inside the roundhouse. We need that vent to be put in place to go ahead and safety channel all of the excess uh, exhaust up and out uh, through the uh, top of the building without filling the roundhouse with smoke or worrying about dumping the monorails up above. The monorails are made out of fiberglass. Let's get a little bit closer. The safety purpose is we cannot go inside the roundhouse. Uh, however, we can get quite up close to the door. So you'll notice the ventilation system up top. Basically a large version of the vent that you would find up above your kitchen stove. Also down below you'll see another fun feature. That is the pit. There's a pit below each one of the bays for maintenance staff members to go underneath and check every single car before they ever take it out in operation. You may notice the stop signs that you see on the ground here in the yard. Those stop signs are in place for the passengers who work on the railroad. Uh, for the morning check, the engineer will pull the stop of each uh, unit. He brings up the stop signs. What that means is that each car is sort of right above that pit. The maintenance staff member underneath checking the car. When it's been cleared for uh, forward motion for that car, the maintenance staff member will quite literally say the phrase, buzz, buzz. There's a conductor standing right up above the pit. There's a buzzer right on the back of each car. You can actually see the buzzer right there. That buzzer right there on the back of the car. Don't touch it. That's where it is. So go ahead and push that buzzer. It's going to buzz the buzz box to the cab twice. Buzz, buzz. You'll hear two short whistles, two, two. And then we'll go ahead and move the train forward to the next set of cars. So every car is going to be checked each and every day before we ever bring the train out into the park. Again, safety is pretty important. Yeah, how many passenger cars are there? How many passenger cars are there? Good question. Let's talk about the passenger cars. Okay. Let's talk about the passenger cars for a moment. Um, any questions about the roundhouse when you want the cars? Right, let's talk about the cars. No, I have a question. Question, yes. Yeah. What's that little thing over there? What's that little thing over there? Yeah. Uh, that is one of the maintenance vehicles for the train tracks themselves. So we can bring that out onto the railroad and have it service anything that we need to service along the route itself. It rides on the tracks just like the trains do. Ah, oh, that's better. <laughs> Uh, so these passenger cars were built for us. These are not original passenger cars, but they are pretty old. They were built about 45 years ago for us. In fact, that's a little longer ago than that. These are what we call Narragansett-style excursion cars. Uh, we built the excursion cars a little bit different than we built the cars for the Disneyland Railroad out in California. How many of you here have been to Disneyland? You've been on the Disneyland Railroad. Uh, one of the things that you might remember is that a lot of the cars for the Disneyland Railroad have side-facing seats. Uh, if you haven't been to Disneyland, have you been over to Animal Kingdom to repeat these Planet Watch? You've been on the train there, they have side-facing seats as well. So the seats actually don't face forward, they face out towards in the interior of the park. At Disneyland, we noticed it was a little bit of an efficiency issue because those trains are very difficult to load and unload. While with these excursion-style cars, we have side-loading seats, so it's very easy to get people on and off of these cars. Each car can carry 75 guests. Each train pulls five cars. So altogether, we have 20 cars. Each train pulls five of them. 
which means that each of these trains can carry 365 guests. Now factor that into a 20 minute round trip. Uh, during a free train operation, every 20 minutes, we can have about 1,200 people riding the Walt Disney World Railroad, which makes it one of the most efficient attractions here at Walt Disney World. Yeah, take a look, there it is. That's monorail, looks like coral coming out. It's red. Oh, I can't tell. What does the monorail ride on? Good question. The monorail cast members will tell you that these are trains. Well, trains, by sort of definition, have to have one source of locomotion that either pulls or pushes. These, you may notice, have wheels underneath every car. And each one of those wheels sort of pushes itself forward. Uh, so there's a source of propulsion on every car. It's not technically a train. Think of it as a giant electric bus, because it runs on electricity. You can see the bar down at the bottom where it's making contact. Monorail I think it's, I think it's, I know, it's the coral one. It is monorail coral. I can see the delta on it now. It is monorail coral. Uh, so back to these passenger cars. Uh, these cars were constructed for us back in the late 60s, early 70s in the building that you see back there, Central Shops. That's where we build and maintain all of our uh, ride vehicles, show sets, audio, and all that building. That's where these cars came from. Uh, and we have five cars for each train. Uh, actually, believe it or not, we have properly hooked up these cars right here. This is the number three set of cars with number three engine. So the Roger should have the yellow cars. Uh, Roy, it looks like, has Lily's cars. So Lily's cars are green. Uh, the number two set of Roy is the right now. I'm guessing that. Yep, yeah, Lily has Walter's cars right now. Uh, the red set, the number one set. Roy's cars are normally blue. They are under refurbishment right now. They'll be coming back on the Questions about the cars? How often do you refurbish? How often do we, furbish, do we refurbish the cars? They've been cycling them out for the last, I guess, three to four years. We have refurbishments on the cars. Any other questions with cars? Uh, how, many cars? how many cars do we have? There's 20 cars. Any other questions? All right, let's talk about the tender. Come on up to the tender. This is the tender. The tender is what is responsible for holding all of the fuel and all of the water that we use to run the steam train. Now, originally, these trains burned coal or wood. Uh, we converted them, they now burn number two diesel. As such, these are not the original tenders. This was sort of built for us, specifically for the train. Uh, since it's custom built, it's got two tanks in it. One tank to hold the fuel, which is the smaller tank, it's 164 gallons of fuel. The larger tank holds the water, 1,837 gallons of water. Uh, the only place we can refuel the train is back here at the Roundhouse. We're going to do that about every uh, once every two weeks or so. Or no, excuse me, twice every week, I'm sorry. Uh, the Roundhouse itself uh, is where we fuel it up, but on the route is where we get the water. There's one water tower here, and that is at the Fantasyland train station. So at the Fantasyland train station, we can refill up the tender with water. We use about 200 gallons of water every hour. So with 1,800 plus gallons in here, we could go, in theory, nine hours without ever having to refill the tender. Will we, in practice, do that? Absolutely not. About every two to three trips to Fantasyland, we are going to go ahead and top off the tender to make sure that it is basically full at all times. We never have to worry about ever running out of water. There's a fun little Disney touch on this tender as well, in this box back right here. In this box houses a generator that powers all of the electrical components of the train. The generator creates electricity using some of the steam from the locomotive itself. So we actually channel some of that steam back here into this generator to create the electricity. Even the electrical components of these trains are running on steam power. Everything about this train runs on steam, which is pretty cool. There is one bit of the tender that is original, and that's down here. It's not the wheels, but the trucks. The trucks will hold the wheels in place. Those are the original trucks from the original tenders uh, back when we first bought these trains. Do we still have the original tenders? No, they were completely rusted through and will be on salvage. Good question. Any other questions? They might maybe twice the size of this because of the volume. Of were they about maybe twice the size of this? I, you know, I believe they were about the same size as this. Maybe a little bit longer. Uh, we'll have, uh, we have some photos later on. We'll check the photos and see. Good question. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, what's that thing there? What's that thing there? Uh, that's a drain valve down there. If we ever need to drain the tender of anything, we can open it up and it'll drain everything. 
how long of a training period for the engineers? How long of a training period for the engineers? To be, after you are a conductor, you must be conductor trained first, it is about a seven day training period for engineer hiring. Yeah. We'll talk about it a little bit later on too. You'll be able to see it in action too. Yeah. How do you become a conductor? How do you become a conductor? <laughs> uh, you got to work here at the Magic Kingdom on Main Street USA for a year. Then you can apply to work as a conductor. After six months as a conductor, then you can apply to work up in the cab. So it's a minimum of 18 months before you see the cab of the steam train. Questions? Let's talk about the actual train itself then. Come on over. Hey. Uh, this is it, in all of its glory. How many of you here know how a steam train works? The three youngest ones in the group are the only ones to raise their hands. Alright, so for all of you uh, bigger kids in the back, I'm going to explain to you how the steam engine works. And what you'll notice is that it's actually a pretty simple process. Uh, we use a lot of very simple terminology and it does sort of flow very logically. It all starts right down here, this large box. That large box is called the firebox. Quite simply, the firebox is a box that holds the fire. Pretty simple, right? The fire is going to create heat. The heat will travel through a draft into the boiler. The boiler starts at this brass ring right here. It's going to continue all the way up to this brass ring right here, this large green tube section. That is the boiler. Through the boiler, run a sort of honeycomb pattern of tubes called flues. Best way to think of flues. Have you ever seen a brand new box of straws? That brand new box of straws, turn it on its side. So you have the straws running horizontally through that box. Uh, the box itself is the boiler, the straws are the flues running through the boiler. So the heat's going to carry through those flues into this black section down here. This black section is called the smoke box. Uh, all of the exhaust and steam will then go ahead and exit up and out through the stack. While the heat is going through the boiler, and in the space surrounding those flues, those straws, is where the water is. When the heat transfers to the water, what happens? Steam. It boils, right? That's why we call it the boiler. <laughs> and when it boils, it creates steam. The steam rises and gathers up here in this section called the steam dome. Inside the steam dome, there is a valve that is connected to the engineer's throttle. That valve will open when the engineer pulls the throttle. The more the engineer pulls the throttle, the more the valve opens, and the more steam will escape from the steam dome. That steam will then travel through a special pipe here at the top of the boiler, all the way down here to the smoke box. Once it gets in the smoke box, it's going to separate into the left and the right side of the train. So steam both sides of the train. I'll describe it on this side, but remember, everything that I'm talking about here is going to be happening on the other side as well. So the steam will come down here into this area here. It's called the steam chest. In the steam chest, there is a valve that is called the D-valve. Right now, the D-valve is in this backwards position. So the steam will be exiting the steam chest down on this side into the cylinder that we see down here. Inside this cylinder is a large piston. Right now that piston is about right here or so. The steam will be building and building and building on this side of that piston, and eventually it's going to build the pressure to such a point that it will actually physically move the piston to the other side of the cylinder. When the piston moves to the other side of the cylinder, the D-valve will switch to the other side of the steam chest. Now the steam is coming down into this side of the cylinder, and that's going to build and build and build, and eventually the piston is going to move back. The D-valve will move back as well, and the whole process repeats itself. It's going to happen so fast that the piston is going to move back and forth and back and forth and back and forth very quickly. As that piston moves back and forth very quickly, we will see that it's connected to this right here. This is called the drive arm. As that drive arm begins to move back and forth, the drive arm, we will see, is connected to the large wheels. They're called the drive wheels. And as the drive arm moves, the drive wheels begin to spin. And as the wheels begin to spin, the train moves forward. That is how steam train works. Simple, right? Repeat it back to you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm just kidding. Uh, there's a lot of fun little touches on this steam train as well. Now, that is just a very little high overview. Let's talk about some of the more fun parts of the train. There's a lot of them on the other side. Just follow me around this side. You'll have plenty of time to take take pictures, I promise. <laughs> Let's talk about this, what we see right here. This pump is the brake pump. So that's responsible for the braking of our trains. Now where do you think the brakes are located here on the train? Where do you think, Ethan? Um, there. There? 
Well, no, they're not actually on the locomotive or on the tender. All of the brakes are located on the cars. Yeah. So it's the cars dragging the locomotive to a stop here on our railroad, not the other way around. The reason for that? Well, remember, this is a theme park attraction. You're facing forward in those seats. If we were to have brakes up here, you'd be dragged to a stop and you'd be pulled forward out of your seat. But if you're dragging the locomotive to a stop, you're actually being pushed back into your seat while the train is breaking. So it's another one of those safety mechanisms. It also means that if we ever need to uncouple this train and recouple it to a new set of cars, the engineer and the fireman have to be very careful because they're doing this with no brakes on the locomotive. So they have to be very, very careful about how they're doing that. Uh, something else that's kind of cool over here is this reason, large number three. That is called the Sand Dome. The Sand Dome does function here at Walt Disney World. Uh, what does the Sand Dome do? Um, the Sand Dome, it puts the, it, like, it takes the sand down the track so it can help it slow down. Not slow down, but it's actually help us with traction to actually get the train going. But you're right, that's exactly what the Sand Dome does. See this pipe coming out of the Sand Dome? It goes right down in front of the drive wheels. If we open up a valve in the sand dome, sand will sprinkle out onto the rails, and in cold or icy conditions, we will use that to gain traction to go ahead and move the train from a dead stop. However, this is Florida. <laughs> Do you think we ever use the sand dome? No, no, we uh, have never used the sand dome. It still works. <laughs> we can open up the valve. We test it every year to make sure it works. But there's no sand in there, and we actually never have used the sand dome because we don't need to worry about it. Sunshine City. Now, something else that we don't use on this train is here for purely cosmetic reasons. This right here. This is a replica antique oiler, or a drip oiler. It does not function. It's there solely for decoration. Uh, back in the day, in order to create some sort of lubricant for the train, what would happen is you would place pig fat or pig lard in there. The heat from the train would cause that to melt. And you take that melted lard or fat and use it to lubricate the parts of the train that we needed to go ahead and have greased up. Well, eventually, of course, oil came around to do this purpose as well. And it was the fireman's job to oil all the vital parts of the train. Now, these need to be oiled up about every 10 miles or so. Do you think back in the heyday of railroading companies that they wanted to stop every 10 miles to go ahead and oil up the train? No, they didn't really want to do that. So what they did is they made the firemen back in this time climb out onto the running boards of the train with a long neck oil can and lean down and oil all of the vital parts of the train while it was in motion. Not safe, right? We lost a lot of oil cans that way. We also had many an injury to our firemen as well. And eventually one man got so fed up with all these injuries, his name was Elijah McCoy. He said, I'm going to create a better way to go ahead and oil these trains. And that's when he created this. This is a McCoy-style automatic oiler. Right, you may see that there's a little miniature drive arm here that's attached to the D-valve. All we do is fill that up with oiler, and then while the train is moving, that drive arm is going to go ahead and pump and use the movement of the train to actually pump oil to all of the vital parts. So it will oil the train while it is moving to make sure that we never have to worry about having someone come out along the side. So as I mentioned, this uh, it was invented by a man named Elijah McCoy. His oiler was very, very successful. In fact, it was so successful that other people began creating their own sort of version of his oiler. But the engineers and the firemen knew which brand of these worked the best. And so whenever a new crew coming on to relieve an old crew from a train, the very first question that new crew or that old crew would be asked was, hey, does this train have the real McCoy? And that's where we get the phrase, the real McCoy. Hmm. It comes from steam trains and oilers. Now, as it happens, that ain't a real McCoy. Uh, that is a more advanced version of it. Technology has sort of come a long way since back then. Uh, but this is, in principle, the exact same style of oiler that Elijah McCoy had. It's just not an actual real McCoy. Yeah. Are we going to be able to go into the roundhouse? Sadly, no. For safety purposes, they won't let us go into the roundhouse. I'm sorry. Yeah? Why is there a flag? Good question. I'll come to that in a second. Could you just point out a couple of the spots where the oil is necessary? Where the oil is necessary? Yeah, it's actually, if you follow the pipes up here, it's difficult to sort of point them out and without getting underneath the train, but if you follow where these little hoses go, they go all the way down down here, sort of where it uh, sort of moves around a little bit. If you follow it up this way, it goes all the way back. Uh, so it's, it's difficult without getting actually underneath the train to see what goes the, on. Uh, the bearings or whatever in the drive uh, rod in, joints. Yeah, in the drive arm itself, we don't use the oil. They don't need to be oiled up as frequently. What we do, though, is that we have our maintenance shed out in Fantasyland. 
uh, and about every four hours, the maintenance crew will be out there. So 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 8 o'clock, they will be out there to meet the cast numbers, and they will perform any maintenance that they need to do for other parts of the train out there. So that automatic oiler does not service the drive line. That's going to be serviced by the actual maintenance cast numbers themselves. Any other questions? Another fun thing up here, the manufacturer's plate here on the side of the smoke box. You can see it is the Baldwin Locomotive Works, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, the serial number of this is 58445, and you can see that it was created in May of 1925. Last month, this train turned 92 years old. You're looking at 92 year old Steve. Incidentally, Roy, out in Bay 1, we saw him earlier, he is our oldest steam train. He was built in February of 1916. He's 101 years old. We have a steam train that is more than 100 years old, still in operation every day. Pretty cool stuff, huh? Well, these manufacturer's plates are replicas. They're not the original ones. The original ones we wanted to make sure we kept completely safe. Uh, they are out at the Walt Disney Archives in Burbank, California. Um, but we do have a perfect replica of it here to sort of reflect the heritage of the train. It would be a 4.6. So we're going to talk all about the white classification system later on today. But good job. Yeah. This is, you know what we call it? It's a ten wheel. It's got ten wheels, right? Four six seven. Good job. Yeah. Flag. What's the flag? Yeah, that's the next thing I'm going to talk about. <laughs> all around the flag. All around the flag. Two more parts of the train I want to talk about, and the first one is the candlestick or the flag pole. Uh, it's actually the only part of the train that you can touch. So if you want to eat and you want to touch it, go ahead. It's the only part of the train that you can touch. It's not hot. It's cold. You can touch it if you want to. Uh, the candlestick carries the classification flag. The classification flag is a different color depending on what sort of this train is classified for. A green train, a green flag train, denotes a specialty train, which makes sense because every day is a special day here at the Magic Kingdom. Uh, one more part of the train to talk about, which is right up here in the front. This red device is properly called the pilot, although you probably know it by a different name. The cow catcher, yeah. It is the job of the pilot, or of the cow catcher, to gently brush away any debris or obstacles that you may find in the track of the front. Let's just say it's painted red for a reason. I'm going to leave it alone. Yeah. <laughs> Alright, this is where the real fun is going to begin, because I've talked all about the outside of the train, we're going to talk about the inside. We are going to go up into the cab of this new train. Before we do, you need to know that it's very small up there. So what we're going to do is go in in groups of about four to five people. Uh, so go ahead and divvy up into your groups. We'll rotate through. Uh, I'm going to turn the microphone off so that you don't hear the same thing multiple times. Uh, while you are not in the train with me, you are free to go ahead and explore the yard to your heart's content with the following restrictions. Number one, don't jump the fence into the road. That's bad. Number two, don't go past that monorail pylon right there, that last one with the bumper. Number three, don't go past the fifth set of tracks you see over there. Number four, do not, for safety purposes, go into the roundhouse. Please stay in this area. The only thing you can take, though, is pictures. Please do not take anything from the yard aside from photographs. Sound good? All right, if the first Both four... Sides. So while we're pausing with this tour here, Fresh Baked, because he's, uh, so the um, tour guide is taking different guests, as he said, four by four, into the... Uh, the caboose, not the caboose, the, con yeah, that thing, the area, right there, the red thing, the red box, that's where they're at. <laughs> I thought I'd just pause and give my thoughts so far. I think it's like super cool, right? How often do you get to, to see all this stuff? Unless you pay for it. <laughs> you don't. <laughs> I don't know. This is, uh, this is a lot of fun. I really want to touch this stuff though. But he said don't touch it because it'll stay on you like all day. And I don't want any of my stuff yellow. Maybe I'll rub my magic band on it because that won't matter. <laughs> but this is cool and he's like you're he said we're allowed to film back here all in the uh, the whole backstage area which is really cool because this this road that you see out here that goes right by the contemporary and it goes right out there. He wouldn't as you saw let me film going backwards but there, there wasn't really anything to see we just rode the train backwards right up to here and then he said uh, we can turn on our cameras and stuff but yeah super informative I'm having a lot of fun so far but um, I think our turn is is coming up here pretty quick but uh, I got some great pictures in front of this train right here so if you haven't already 
follow me on Twitter, follow me on uh, Instagram. You'll uh, you'll see these pictures on here. But uh, Instagram, Fresh Baked WDW, and Twitter at Laramie Williams. So, yeah, I think we're gonna continue our little tour here. We'll continue our little tour. Anyone ever been up in one of these before? Mm -mm. No. No. Yeah, it is very hot up here, as you'll notice. Uh, and that's what it's like without a fire burning in here. Imagine if we had a fire burning in here. It's very hot up here. Uh, this may look a little bit overwhelming for you at first, but I'm going to go ahead and break it down for you very simply based on what each person uses who would sit up here. So we'll start with that seat over there. That's the fireman's seat. The chief job of the fireman is to build and maintain the fire. That happens down here inside the fire box. In order to light the fire, the fireman's going to take a ball of what we call waste. Basically, it's the inside of a mattress material. We're going to soak it in number two diesel oil, hold it in our hands, light it on fire, take that fireball, and throw it by hand into this fire box down here. You're going to see that happen later on today, too, so you'll be able to see that whole process. Uh, once the fire is inside, that gives us a source of ignition. Now we need something to ignite, which is where the fuel comes in. That brass lever right there is the fuel lever. As you pull that lever towards me, fuel will flow from the tender into the firebox. The fireman's also going to use this valve right here. This valve is called the atomizer. The atomizer is going to act as a perfume spritzer. Think of it as kind of a mister. It's going to go ahead and break that fuel up into that fine mist, so it'll make it easier to light and easier to combust. So the fireman's going to use the fuel lever and the atomizer hand in hand to build and maintain a perfect fire. Think about when you're in the shower, one hand on the hot, one hand on the cold, you gotta have just the right mixture between the two of them. Uh, that's basically what the fireman is doing here. The fireman's also going to monitor the pressure level inside the boiler using this gauge up here. Uh, looks like we have about 125 pounds of pressure in there, which is pretty good. Uh, between 90 and 140 is where we want to be. Anything below 90 or 140, we need to make adjustments to the fire in order to bring the pressure up or down. The fireman's also going to measure the water level inside the boiler utilizing this slide here. This is called the sight glass. Uh, we use a fun little unit of measurement here. We measure this in bolts. So literally on the sight glass, one bolt, two bolts, three bolts, four bolts, five bolts of water. Looks like we are currently on just over three bolts of water, so that's pretty good. Uh, anywhere between two and four is where we want to be as far as that is concerned. And then finally, the most fun part about being the fireman is that when you pull into the train station, you get to pull on that rope right there, that is connected to the bell outside, so you get to ring the bell as you pull into the station, but only if the train is accepting guests. If the train is not accepting guests, you will not hear the bell. That is our cue for the station conductor to go ahead and begin to load the guests onto the train. Uh, if it seems simple for the fireman, it's because it is. With enough training, anyone can be a good fireman. It's actually a very simple job. Uh, the real fun is in this seat right here. This is where the engineer sits. And the chief tool of the engineer is this handle right here. This is the throttle. The more you pull the throttle towards me, the train goes. And of course, the more you do it, the faster it will go. Uh, there's the speedometer. It goes all the way up to 20 miles an hour, although we don't like to go above 10 or so. Uh, so that's a nice little temptation for us up here to have a speedometer that goes all the way to 20. Uh, on the other side, you can see the buzz box. That buzz box is connected to the buzzer in the back for the conductor. So whenever the conductor buzzes, the red light will illuminate and you'll hear the buzzer sound here in the cab. Uh, Walter has the best buzzer because it's an old Volkswagen horn. Yeah. Yeah. Sadly, we're not able to hear that today because Walter's not here, but Roger's got a pretty good buzzer as well, but not as fun as Walter's Volkswagen horn. Uh, something else that the engineer is going to use is this handle right here. This is called the Johnson bar here in the United States, the United Kingdom, I believe it's called the reverser. This acts as basically, in a way, the gear shift of the train. Right now it's in the neutral position, but if you want the train to go forward, the first thing you do is you take the Johnson bar and push it forward. If you want the train to go backwards, you take the Johnson bar and pull it backwards. The gear shift of the train, in a way. Uh, this brass lever down here is the brake handle. This is not like the brakes in your car where you can ease into it. Uh, it has two positions. This has on and off. So that's why you may have felt the brakes pumping as we were going down the back stretch or pulling into a station because we need to pump our brakes in order to make sure that we can bring the train to a stop. And then finally, the most fun part about being an engineer, and I can safely say this having done it myself several times, this handle right here. It's the whistle. Pull down on this handle and the whistle blows and it is the most fun part about operating the trains here. That's it. I know it all looks very complicated, but it breaks down pretty simply. Questions about what you see up here? Anything you want to know more about? Yeah, Julie. The buzzer, does each one have its own sound, or is Walter special? Uh, Walter's the only one that has the Volkswagen horn, so each one has its own sound in the way that each whistle is going to sound unique as well. Um, if you're really, really good at it, you can identify the train that you're, that you're that is approaching based on the whistle. Um, some of us can do that, some of us can not. Are those part of the, like, were those original or were those added? Uh, I believe the, well, there was a buzzer system in place, but I believe that buzzer system itself is new because we had to install it onto the cars. Yeah. With the, uh, you, you said the fireman's got a pretty easy job, but with that mister right there. Yes, the atomizer. Yeah, and, and figuring out the levels, is that something that you can just do, or is it something that changes every single day? You always need to It changes out, right? every single day. 
uh, with the atmospheric conditions and things like that. But once you figure it out for that day, I mean, you're basically you're monitoring the level here. If you need more water, then you can go ahead and inject water in through your injectors on either side. Uh, if you need to build the pressure up, then you notice the pressure's dropping, and you can go ahead and maybe add more fuel and adjust the atomizer to make the fire bigger. If the pressure's too high, cut the fire, lower it down in order to bring the pressure down. So it's all sort of playing on your environment. You look at all your gauges, you look at all your sight glasses, figure out where you need to be, and then adjust it based on that. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. When were they converted from coal? Was that uh, Disney thing? Yeah. Or so they were converted when we bought them. Okay. We spent about 18 months refurbishing the trains. And that conversion was part of it. Anyone else? Thanks for coming out. Cool. Thanks. Got Thanks. Five, five, five. When you were talking about the, uh, the monorails and the, the side wheels and what's yeah. propelling it, mm -hmm. what's on the top side? There's, is that we, just, there's wheels just, as now, well. Now, is that propelling or is that just support? Both. Both? So, what's on top? It's wheels. Just, wheels on top. Yeah. Do they top go round and round? Yeah, they do. They do go round. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> On the big electric bus. Uh, all right, let's talk about another fun part of the train, this little Disney creation over here. Uh, take a look. Let me slide over here to show you. Stay back there. I'm going to show you. This large black tube right here, right by the pump there. That first one. So the large black tube. Uh, that tube is called the heat exchanger. The heat exchanger was the brainchild of someone who worked here on the railroad named George Britton. George Britton is someone who we met at the Tampa Bay Shipyard Company uh, when we were refurbishing these trains. Uh, he was working on steam ships at the time. He said, how different can steam trains be? He said, and we will learn about the steam trains. He oversaw the refurbishment. In fact, found out he loved steam trains. Loved them so much that when we were done refurbishing the trains, we hired him to be the foreman here at the Walt Disney World Railroad, a position he held for 35 years until he retired in 2006. They'd say, no one knows these trains better than George Britton. Well, George Britton noticed that we were using a lot of fuel to operate these trains, as you do. Said, well, let's come up with a way to save fuel costs. And that's when he came up with the idea of the heat exchanger. The heat exchanger takes water coming from the tender and preheats it before it goes into the boiler. Uh, that way it's entering the boiler warm instead of cold, which means it's going to boil a lot quicker, which means we use less fuel. Uh, George Britton brought this idea to the executives. They loved it, and then they saw how much it cost. And they said, never mind, we're not interested anymore. But George knew it was a good idea. So what he did was he secretly built one on his own and installed it on the Lily Bell without telling anybody. Executives notice that Lily Bell is using a lot less fuel than she ever was before. They call in George and ask why that is. He says, I put a heat exchanger on it. And they said, you did what? Three more, please. And that's how we ended up with the heat exchanger. Go ahead and take a look now. You can see they're getting the train ready for the operating day. Uh, they're checking all of the various fuel valves. There are about 15 valves that need to be critically checked to make sure we can out the train up. And we start doing creating a draft through the train from the firebox, through the boiler and the smoke box up and out. The stack that you can see, what I call purging the stack right now. Any excess sediment or steam that's left in there is going to be purged up and out through the stack. You ever heard the expression living on the wrong side of the tracks? Well, it comes from this right here. Uh, all of that sediment would come up and if you were downwind, it would sort of blow down onto your lawn or your laundry. <laughs> That's how it would sort of uh, get that expression out into the public vernacular. Uh, the whistle will be blown, but not yet. Instead, we're going to light the train first. Get your cameras ready, everyone. This is your Kodak moment. Oh, it's your Nikon moment for the Nikon moment. Uh, take a look. There it is, the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> take that ball, throw it into the firebox. You begin lighting the train, and trust me, you will be able to hear it when this train comes alive. You may be able to see some of the fire burning in the firebox down below, or the fuel catches. Creating glass right now. There it is. Awesome. <laughs> With that, this train is coming alive. Trains and the engineers will tell you this have their own individual personality. You have to really get to know these trains to operate them. Here at the Walt Disney World Railroad, we consider these trains to be actual living creatures. These are not machines that we turn on, these are beings that we wake up. And we're about to wake up the Roger right now, getting ready to go. Go ahead and take any last minute photographs that you want right here. Safety is 
course, is very important to us. We're going to go through some of the safety checks that we do every day before we take these trains out into the park. Uh, we're going to recreate some of those for you here. Uh, rest assured, these have already undergone all of the safety checks necessary for operation in the park. Uh, but we're going to recreate them for the purposes of the tour. The first one is going to be the pop-off test. Pressure can build inside the boiler to such a point where bad things can happen if the pressure gets too high. So before we ever get to that unsafe level, we've installed a little safety feature. On top of the steam dome, there's a valve called the, call the pop-off valve. And if the pressure reaches a high enough point, the pop-off valve will open and allow any excess, there's the buzzer, allow any excess, or, uh, any excess excuse me, steam out of the steam dome to escape through the top. It is a very loud sound. Uh, and a very long sound as well. You'll be able to see the steam just escaping at the top like a giant pillar. Uh, we intentionally pop the train off each and every day here in the yard uh, in order to make sure that we know at which pressure point we will have each and every day. So that can be different based on the weather and the atmosphere conditions. So we will intentionally do it here in the yard every day. We're going to write down that pressure point on the train's paperwork every day so that every crew that comes on the train will know what that point is. And hopefully it'll never happen in the park. We don't like to pop off inside the park because it's very loud and it distracts from the show in the park. In addition, it can also cause attraction downtimes. For example, one time the train popped off in the Frontierland train station, which is very close to Splash Mountain and Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. Coordinators working at those attractions heard the pop off. They didn't know what it was and assumed the sound was coming from their attraction. So they shut down both of their attractions for an unusual noise. <laughs> Nothing was wrong with them. They just heard something. Which they knew what they were supposed to do. They heard a weird noise. They shut down the attraction. But we ended up uh, losing Splash Mountain and Thunder Mountain that day for about an hour because of the <laughs> While we're waiting for the train to go ahead and pop off here, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about why trains are so important to us here at the Walt Disney Company. It goes back to 1927, when Walt created his very first successful cartoon character. Do you all know who that was? Steamboat Willie. Steamboat Willie was the name of a film, not a character. Oswald. Oswald. Yeah, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit was Walt's very first successful cartoon character. Huge success through 1927 and 1928. In 1928, Walt Disney was called to a meeting in New York City with the distributor of the Oswald cartoons, a man named Charles Mintz. Walt was pretty excited to go to this meeting because he thought he was going to get more money to produce more Oswald cartoons. Charles Mintz had other things in mind. Not only did he want Walt to take a nice little pay cut, he also reminded Walt that there was a little loophole in the contract that they had signed and it was no longer Walt Disney who owned the rights to Oswald, it was Charles Mintz. Charles Mintz had also hired away all of Walt's animators in secret without telling him, so it left Walt with basically absolutely nothing. Why did he do that? Why did he do that? Because Charles Mintz was a greedy man. Okay. <laughs> Uh, Walt was completely devastated. The idea behind it was that he was going to then sign Walt to an exclusive contract for his company, but Walt didn't like that sort of shady deal that he did, so yeah. Walt said, I'm never signing with you ever again. Uh, he would rather do a Boswell than work for Charles Mintz. Yeah. Uh, so Walt basically had everything taken away from him. He's now on this train ride back to Hollywood with his wife. He's beginning to feel feelings of depression that he hasn't felt in a very long time. In fact, since the early 1920s, when he was working at his first animated, animation studio called Laugh Grand Films, Walt didn't really have anybody in Kansas City. He didn't have any friends. He hadn't met his wife really yet. In fact, the only friend he had was a little mouse who lived in his cartoon studio. And this mouse would sort of climb up onto Walt's desk. Walt would start talking to this mouse. He would feed him some crumbs off of his desk. Uh, begin to even draw little, little sketches of this mouse. Well, Walt begins to tell Lillian about this since he's feeling these feelings for the first time in many years. He says, Lillian, I don't know if I've ever drawn this mouse for you. So for the first time in many years, Pressure. We can do it on that bridge just above a water system. We can also do it uh, over here at the Fantasyland Station because there's a special vent system in place that will channel all of that out into the water feature that's behind us. Uh, if we were to run that, uh, run that uh, blow off really anywhere else besides one of those two places, we're using such a high pressure to send out that steam and that water that we could go ahead and actually put a hole in concrete. Cast members out here in order to service the train again every four hours when that happens. We'll greet them with our own special
Yeah. A lot of speed. Coming out down here. Yeah. It's coming out down there and then it's like sort of escaping up. Uh, so anyway, we'll greet the maintenance passengers with their own special whistle. It's the inverse of the crossing whistle. So it's two short whistles, a long whistle, then a short whistle. Uh, the train station that we're in right now is the Fantasyland train station. It's also the newest station here at Walt Disney World. The origins of the Fantasyland station go all the way back to 1988 to something called Mickey's Birthday Land. It eventually became Mickey's Starland and then Mickey's Toontown Fair before finally getting a full refurbishment in 2012 to become this, the Fantasyland station. Uh, this area, Storybook Circus, as part of Fantasyland, was designed by an Imagineer who you may have heard of. His name is John Lasseter. Not only is he an Imagineer, he's also an executive in charge of Pixar. He also happened to really love steam trains, particularly the steam trains here at the Walt Disney World Railroad. What he realized when he was building this area is that there was nowhere in the park where you could have your picture in front of the steam train. It was always you on the side of the steam train. So that's when he insisted that this area right here be built. This is called Lasseter Point. Lasseter Point is the only place in Air Walt Disney World where you can stand right there at the end where you see those train tracks are, and you can stand and get your picture in front of the train while the train is in the park. The only place you can do that, the other place that you would be able to do that is on this door, out of the yard. But that's not really in the park, is it? They've noticed it's a little bit difficult to leave the uh, Fantasyland train station because now we're going uphill. Remember, we went downhill back in the back stretch, now we have to go uphill. We're going up something called a 2% grade. What that means is that for every 100 feet of track, we are going up 2 feet in elevation. So especially if it's sort of like a rainy day, it may be difficult for us to leave the station uh, because of immediate uphill grade. This is the final crossing whistle that we're going to hear. This crossing whistle is not for parade floats or for cars, instead it's for pedestrians. It is for the cast members who work inside the Space Mountain. Space Mountain is the only attraction at the Magic Kingdom that is built in its entirety outside of the Magic Kingdom's perimeter. It is entirely located outside the railroad track. If you, however, enter the building on this side of the railroad track, then you go underneath them in the queue. That long dip in the queue, and then you go right back up, we're above that dip right now. The dip exists to get you underneath the train track and in the Space Mountain. Going back to John Lasseter for just one moment, John Lasseter had a mentor in his animation career. That mentor's name was Ollie Johnston. Ollie Johnston was one of Walt Disney's nine old men, they called one of his early animators who animated in a lot of the classic Disney films. Ollie Johnston also had a very large love of trains. In fact, it was so large that he had his own full-size steam train in his backyard. He called the Marie E. And he loved to operate the Marie E, but eventually, of course, he did get too old to do that. So, uh, when he did get too old to do that, he decided to sell his train to his mentee, John Lasseter, who also loves steam trains. John Lasseter spent three years refurbishing the Marie E, and when it was completed in 2005, he decided that he wanted to honor Ollie Johnson and his career at the Disney Company, as well as his legacy with railroading. So what John did was he held through a little ceremony for Ollie at Disneyland one morning in 2005 before the park opened. Ollie Johnson's about 90 years old at this point. He is in a wheelchair. The ceremony takes place at the New Orleans Square train station. He was told that he was going to be a ceremony honoring his career to the company and to railroading. Uh, big ceremony, speeches, hooray, hurrah. Well, imagine the look, on surprise, look of surprise on Ollie's face, but at the end of the ceremony, he hears a train whistle. And out of the tunnel in New Orleans Square comes a steam train. But it's not one of the Disneyland trains. It's Ollie's train, the Marie E, which John Lasseter had personally paid to bring to Disneyland that day. The idea was that Ollie Johnson would be able to operate his train around Disneyland. Well, a little bit of a problem. In order to operate the trains at Disneyland, you need to be a cast member, and Ollie had retired. So John Lasseter gave Ollie a contract to Pixar for one day for a total of one dollar. That made him once again a cast member, which meant that Ollie was able to operate his train around Disneyland. He took it for three laps around the park that morning. It was the last time he ever operated his train, and it's also the only time that a non-Disney train has ever run on a Disney railroad. Nowadays, the Marie E. runs out at the Lasseter Family Winery in California. So if you go out to the Lasseter Winery and you ride the Justy Creek Railroad, you can get a little ride on Ollie Johnson's train. Here we are at Main Street, USA. Good morning. Welcome back to the channel. Open, we are ready to go. Uh, we will be disembarking in just a moment. Please wait for so this is the last chance on the tour to get up close and personal pictures with the steam train. So if you want to go ahead and do that, now is the time to get the camera away from the other side. Okay, this is the last chance on the tour to get up close and personal pictures with the steam train. 
stop where the block light is located. Welcome back to Main Street USA. Looks a little bit different than the last time we were here, right? Pretty crowded. Main Street USA is supposed to represent a very specific time and place. That time and place is the turn of the century in a small town in the middle of America, 1901, that we're trying to represent. In small towns like this one, trains really were the centerpiece of everything. Have you ever looked at a map in the United States uh, and realized that all these small towns in the country are about 50 miles apart from each other? The reason for that is because of trains. Trains would have to start off getting fueled up every 50 miles or so. They would have to get more fuel, more water, more supplies. So about every 50 miles or so, these trains, uh, excuse me, these trains would sort of have to stop and these small towns sort of sprung up in order to service the trains. Therefore, the central building in these towns was a train station, just like this one. Train stations became the centerpiece of the towns. These were the areas of commerce, these were the areas of trade. If you wanted to meet someone, chances are you would go to the train station to do that. It makes sense then that here in our small town on Main Street, USA, the anchor building is the train station. And that's why the train station is the first building that you see when you enter Main Street, USA. It was in a small town just like this one in the early 1900s that a little boy went to a train station similar to this one and fell in love with these trains. He actually loved them so much that really in everything he did throughout his career, trains ended up having some sort of role. He did a lot of different things over the course of his lifetime, but he always seemed to come back to trains. That little boy, as I'm sure you guessed, is Walt Disney. The second half of our tour this morning will focus entirely on Walt and his love of trains and why it is so important that we continue to have these hundred year old steam trains in our park today. But before we do that, uh, we are going to take a little bit of a break, a half time break. So follow me this way to Town Square here. Welcome to the air conditioning. <laughs> Uh, uh, we do have some bottles of water for you here to go ahead and take. Please take one. They are free. Yes, free from the Walt Disney Company. Please go ahead and take a bottle of water. Uh, we have a restroom. We so spent our morning talking about the steam trains themselves. But why do we have these trains? It all does go back to that one man who I talked about earlier, Walt Disney. Walt Disney did grow up with a love of steam trains, really thanks to his hometown where he was raised, Marceline, Missouri. Anyone here ever been to Marceline before, by any chance? Very few people ever tell me they've been to Marceline. A Marceline Central Building was a train station, much like the one that we have outside. Walt spent a lot of time at this train station. He heard a lot of stories from the people who were working on these trains, and these really fascinated young Walt. And it wasn't just at the train station that he was hearing these stories. He also heard these stories from his own family members as well. Walt's father, Elias, had worked to support the track layers for the Union Pacific Railroad. And Walt grew up hearing stories about Elias' time on the railroad. In fact, Walt's favorite story was the time that his dad got to meet and shake the hand of noted wild enough showman Buffalo Bill Cody. So Walt was very enthused to hear that story. Uh, the stories continued on, though. Walt heard them from other family members, too, such as his Uncle Mike. Uncle Mike Martin was an engineer for the Ashton Topeka and Santa Fe Railroad. And this railroad ran basically right through Walt's backyard on his farm when he was growing up. So whenever Walt would hear a train outside, he would always go running outside and wave to the train. And if he got a special whistle back, he would know that it was his Uncle Mike who was operating that train. Of course, Uncle Mike didn't always operate the train. When he wasn't operating the train, sometimes he would come over for dinner. And he would again regale young Walt Disney on stories of working on the train. Even Walt's best friend, his older brother Roy, worked on the train as well. Roy worked as something called a news butcher. A news butcher is responsible for selling things like cigarettes, cigars, uh, newspapers, magazines, snacks, drinks, selling these things to people who are on the train. Uh, the idea is that the news butcher buys them in sort of a bulk price and then marks them up to sell to the people on the train and that's how the news butcher makes money. Roy was very good at this. Roy was a very smart businessman, always had a keen sense of money. Uh, he made a lot of money working as a news butcher. But, as you can imagine, he did have a lot of stories from working on the steam trains as well, right? And he would come home and tell Walt these stories. 
Well, remember, Roy is Walt's very best friend. Walt idolizes everything that Roy does. So what do you think when uh, Walt turns 15 years old that he wants to do? He wants to be a news butcher just like his older brother Roy was. Not, just, not because he wants to necessarily make a lot of money like Roy did, but because he wants to work on trains. So, Walt realizes it's going to be about $30 to start up as a news butcher. Problem here though, Walt didn't have $30. Roy did! So Walt asked his older brother to loan him the $30 to start up being a news butcher, news butcher, and Roy did just that. Roy would later go on to say that this was not the first nor the last time that he would loan his little brother money only to never see it again. Right? <laughs> of course, the sums just got larger and larger and larger as Walt grew older and older and older. So Walt begins his career as a news butcher, and while Roy was insistent on making as much money as possible, Walt didn't care about that. Walt quickly sold away everything that he could so he could have more time exploring the trains. And one day, as he's exploring the trains after he sells everything, he's eventually managed to make his way up to the cab of the train. Fireman looks in, sees this little kid who wants to come in the train, and says, well, tell you what, why don't you come back tomorrow with one of these large cigars that you're selling for me, I will let you into the cab of the train, and I'll show you how to shovel coal. Oh, oh boy, imagine how excited Walt was. He's going to learn how to work on a real steam train. So he comes next night, fair enough, he's got a big cigar for the fireman. The fireman does show him how to shovel coal, stoke the fire, build it up a nice roaring way, monitor the pressure inside. Walt's loving this because he's working on the steam train. The fireman's loving this because he's got this little kid doing his job for him. The only person who's really upset about what's going on is the engineer, who still has to do his job. So the engineer turns to Walt and says, I'll tell you what, kid, you come back tomorrow with another one of these big cigars for me, and I'll show you where the real power of the train is. Imagine how excited Walt was now. He comes back the next day, another big cigar. The engineer shows him how to operate the train and lets Walt blow the whistle. Imagine all those times Walt, as a child, heard those whistles going through his yard. Now he's 15 years old. He gets to actually be the one to sound the whistle itself. He was thrilled. Walt spent about two years working as a, new, working as a news butcher uh, before World War I begins to break out, both Roy and Walt go overseas to help sort of the country. So at this point, we're going to go ahead and put a little pause on Walt's story. We're going to pick it up again after the war is over. But for now, let's head back out into Main Street. We're going to talk a little bit about the people that for him, that each train, I should say, is for. Let's start with the one that we spent all morning with, the robbery and Brody. Everyone's sort of gathering around this area where everyone can see these pictures. Forgot what the Roger E. Brogy looks like. Here it is. Uh, this is, as we pointed out, uh, who was it that pointed out the wheel classification back at the roundhouse? Uh, who pointed out it was a 460? Was you? Yeah, it's a 460, right? Uses the, using the white classification system, this train is what we call a 460 or a 10 wheeler style of train because it's got four pilot wheels up in the front. The job of the pilot wheels is to keep the train on the track and also helps to steer into curves a lot easier. Four of those pilot wheels. Six drive wheels, which are the big wheels are responsible for actually driving the train and pushing it forward. And then zero trailing wheels. Trailing wheels would exist underneath the main cab. They exist to support the uh, weight of the cab, and they're usually found on a lot larger trains. You're never going to see pile or, uh, the trailing wheels here at the Walt Disney World Railroad. None of our locomotives have them. This is what we call a 10 wheeler style train, 460, built as we know in May of 1925, and it is named after this man, Roger E. Brogan. Roger E. Brogy went to a school called the Moose Heart Academy, a sort of vocational school where he studied machinery. He studied how to be a machinist. He made his name in Hollywood, not just working in machine shops, but working as a camera repairman. In fact, Walt loved him so much because Roger was the only person who was able to repair the small miniature cameras that Walt used in a lot of his productions. Roger was very good at repairing those, and he was hired on by Walt to work at his studio in the machine shop, as well as in the repair shop. Well, Roger was an expert machinist, and when Walt Disney decided that he was going to build a train of his very own, he turned to Roger to be the one to help him build that train in the machine shop. This skill was then put to greater use later on in the mid-1950s, when Walt decides he's going to open up Disneyland. Roger had already built one train for Walt. This one was a lot smaller than what it would be at Disneyland. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on today. But when it came time to build the Disneyland Railroad, Walt turned to Roger to help create the first two locomotives for Disneyland. And that's exactly what Roger did. He built 5 8 scale, narrow-gauge locomotives. Two of them. 
for Disneyland at the grand total of $40,000 each. So $80,000 in the 1950s to build two narrow gauge locomotives. I just throw around the term gauge. Does anyone know what the term gauge refers to? Yeah, the distance between the rails, right? So there's standard gauge and narrow gauge. Anyone know standard gauge and the distance between the rails is a standard gauge? Do you know anything? Uh, no. Do you know? Close. Four feet, eight and a half inches. Four feet, eight and a half inches is standard gauge. Narrow gauge, naturally, is a lot smaller. That's what we have here at the park. Anyone want to guess narrow gauge? 36. 36 inches for narrow gauge. So three feet between the rails. 36 inches narrow gauge. We decided to use narrow gauge in the theme park for a few reasons. Number one, the theme park was built scaled down. So if we had that standard size train, the standard gauge train, it would look very out of place. Number two, narrow gauge trains handle both curves and inclines a lot better than standard gauge trains do. Uh, so for those reasons, we decided to create narrow gauge trains for the theme parks. And we built the very first two of them for the Disneyland Railroad. In 1958, the Disneyland Railroad proved to be so popular that Walt decided he wanted to expand it with two additional locomotives. Well, instead of building two of our own, what we decided to do was send Roger out on a little mission to find two existing narrow gauge locomotives and convert them uh, to run on the Disneyland Railroad. That's what he did. He did find two more. So in uh, 1958, now the Disneyland Railroad has four locomotives. There's now a fifth locomotive on the Disneyland Railroad that was added in 2005. That was after Roger passed away. So Roger had nothing to do with the fifth locomotive. The first four really all had Roger's name on them, whether he was building them or finding them. Well, in the late 1960s, we knew we were going to build the Magic Kingdom. And Walt was insistent that, of course, there be a railroad here as well. So who do we turn to to find our trains? We turn to Roger Brogy. Roger Brogy, the railroading expert, begins to do a search all across the country for new, or for rather, existing narrow gauge locomotives to put into the new version of Disneyland, the Magic Kingdom. Doesn't find anything, so eventually he begins searching worldwide. Still can't find anything. He starts reaching out to people saying, hey, can you figure out anything? Do you know where I can find narrow gauge locomotives that no one wants anymore? He heard a rumor that someone may have some down in the Yucatan Peninsula. So in order to confirm this, what he did was reach out to a friend of his, a man named Jerry Best. Jerry Best was, and there really is no good way to put this, a railroad freak. Jerry Best had the largest private collection of railroad memorabilia in the world. We're talking 130,000 items in his collection. Things like photographs, blueprints, journals, all kinds of things uh, that uh, uh, Jerry Best had in his collection. In fact, Jerry Best had quite literally written the book, several of them, on railroads. And what he decided to do was actually just finish up working on a book. He was that uh, the book he was working on was titled Narrow Gauge in Mexico, or Mexican Narrow Gauge. So when Roger reaches out to him and says, hey, do you know any narrow gauge trains in Mexico? Jerry Best says, yup. Jerry Best directs him to go to the town of Merida in Mexico, or Merida as we would say it, uh, to find these narrow gauge locomotives. Uh, incidentally, by the way, uh, remember we said how John Lasseter was a big fan of the Disney steam trains? Well, we found them in Merida, Mexico. Makes sense then that when John Lasseter has to name his first red-headed princess, since these trains were referred to by the Lion natives as the Atokaks Makak, which translates roughly to fire bulls of the Yucatan, since they would see the firebox and the glow of the headlamp, comes time for John Lasseter to name his first red-headed character in a Pixar movie. Her name is Merida. Coincidence? Mm. I'm just putting it out there. I don't know whether that was the actual naming suggestion for it, uh, but it's kind of as a coincidence, right? I have to imagine somewhere along the way John Lasseter knew what he was doing. So anyway, we're going to have these trains down in Merida. Roger needs to go and inspect these trains. So he's going to head down to the Yucatan Peninsula to do this, but the budget is so tight that he can only take one other person with him. So he now has a choice down to two people. Option number one, Roger can take with him a man named Earl Vilmer. Earl Vilmer was the railroad superintendent for Disneyland for the past 17 years. He knew everything there was to know about trains, he knew everything there was to know about theme parks, and he knew everything there was to know about how trains operated in the theme parks. And his knowledge would prove to be invaluable. Or option number two, Roger could take with him a man named Tony Sepulveda. 
Tony Sepulveda worked at Disneyland, yes, but he did not work with the trains at all. In fact, he did not even work in operations. Tony Sepulveda worked in the horticulture department. But Tony Sepulveda spoke Spanish. So, imagine now that you are Roger Brogy. Who are you going to take with you on this trip? Are you going to take Earl, your train expert, or Tony, your Spanish speaker? Who you taking? You're going to take Tony, the Spanish speaker? That seems to be the general consensus, right? Not for Roger. Roger took her. <laughs> so, me, take a train guy with us, right? Figure they can get on with whatever Spanish they knew. This may have proven to be a little bit of a mistake, which we'll talk about a little later on. But Roger and Earl do go down to Mexico, and sure enough, in Florida, they find a huge warehouse, a boneyard, full of narrow gauge locomotives. Four of them in particular catch the eyes of Roger and Earl, and they want to buy them. They hangs it up in this boneyard across the street. There is a park. A fifth narrow gauge locomotive has been set up in that park, sort of as a display piece. They like to look at that one too, and they say, We want that one as well. As it turns out, all five of these locomotives were owned by the United Railways of the UK. So we went ahead and made payment with them, said, so How much do you want for these locomotives? They said, All right, we'll give you a little deal. The first four, the ones that you found in the warehouse, in the boneyard, $8,000 a piece. The fifth one in the park, We'll throw it in as a little bonus for you. $750 for the fifth Pokemon. This should have been a clue about something, right? But look at it from the big picture. $32,750 gets us five locomotives when just about 20 years ago we spent 80 grand building them two of our own. We're gonna take that deal. So we go ahead and make the final finalization for the payment. But then we run into a little bit of legal tape. This legal red tape has to do with a law in Mexico at the time that said you could not export machinery from the country. And these trains certainly do qualify as machinery. Well, we really wanted to buy these trains, so Disney did what Disney does best. We got the legal team involved. And what our lawyers pointed out was, well, hang on, hang on, yes, these trains work in Mexico, yes, they're owned by a Mexican company, and they are currently now in Mexico, yes, but these trains were built by Baldwin, right, in Philadelphia. That is very much in the United States, which means these trains are not Mexican, they are American trains. Are you really, therefore, exporting these trains? No, if anything, we're just bringing these trains back home. So, why can't we buy them again? The Mexican government somehow agreed with all of this, and they did allow us to, for $32,750, purchase those five locomotives. Wait. Yes? There's only four trains. There are only four trains. Yes. We'll get to it in just a second. Good. Uh, so, the time came for us to transport these five locomotives to Tampa, where we were going to refurbish them. Roger and Earl went down to the shipyard, or rather, excuse me, to the United Ways of the Yucatan, and they said, when do you want us to send the flatbed cars to take them to the shipyard in Tampa? And the United Railways of the Yucatan said, oh, no, no, don't worry about that. We will take care of the transportation for you. See, they were very proud of the facts that they were the ones supplying the trains for the new version of Disneyland. The Disneyland Railroad had become an iconic image known all across the world. And this new version of Disneyland is going to have a railroad, and they get to be the ones to supply these trains that are going to be seen by millions of people around the world. They were very proud of this fact. So they made special flatbed cars with big signs on them that said where they were going when they were going to Disney World. And then there was a big sign on it too that said, Echo en Mexico, made in Mexico. So that everyone would always know where these trains were coming from. Before they even crossed the Mexican border, they caused a stir because people lined up along the train tracks just to catch a glimpse of these locomotives as they were in transit to Tampa. And finally, they do make it to Tampa. And that is where we meet George Martin. George Britton helps oversee the restoration of our locomotives, and sure enough, four of them eventually managed to make their way into the theme parks. Four, not five, as even pointed out. Wow, what happened to that fifth locomotive? Well, that one that we found in the park that we got for a real cheap deal. Maybe if Tony had been there, we would have seen it right away, because they were speaking Spanish about it, but it was a complete rust. It was held together by nothing more than rust and paint. In fact, when we took it to Tampa, George Britton was even able to take his fist and punch it through the side of the boiler. Not held together well at all. We saved what little bits of it we could, but the vast majority of us went off for scrap. So we only have four locomotives, and George Britton oversaw an 18-month refurbishment of those four trains. And 
just 18 months, we were able to convert them from the way they looked when we bought them, and I'll show you them a little bit later on today, all the way up to what you still see them. But to Disneyland and to Walt's personal railroad as well. Roger Broke, one of the most important figures in the history of Disney Railroad, it makes sense then that we have his name on the side of one of our locomotives. But the original namesake of the number three locomotive was not intended to be Roger. We intended to name the number three locomotive after someone else. After this man over here, Roy O. Disney. Nowadays, the number four locomotive is named after Roy. Uh, this is a picture of Roy, so you're wondering what he looks like. We saw him earlier in that statue out there. Uh, but here is the Roy O. Disney locomotive. We saw it earlier in the roundhouse. A little bit different wheel configuration than the other one that we saw today. Uh, this is a 440, so four pilot wheels, four drive wheels, zero trailing wheels. It's what we call an American style train. 440. It is named after Walt's older brother, Roy O. Disney. Uh, Roy O. Disney, again, was really the financial genius behind the Walt Disney company, Walt Walt Disney Creative. But Roy had to sort of step out and be a little bit of a creative one when it came time to building the Magic Kingdom. Walt passed away in 1966. We didn't break ground here until 1967. So Walt Disney never got to see any of this, even under construction, uh, let alone complete. In fact, the only thing, really, that Walt got to say as far as the influence of the Magic Kingdom was that there would be a railroad here. Roy went out of his way to make his little brother's dreams come true. Everything that you see around you here in the park was built because of Roy, for Walt. And Roy didn't want any credit at all. He was a very humble person. In fact, Roy even changed the name of this place from what his brother had always called it, Disney World, to what it's still called today. Walt Disney World, because Roy didn't want to get anyone confused. This was Walt's dream, not his. He had done all of this for Walt. Well, as a little tribute to what he did, we said, hey Roy, we want to name one of the trains that Walt said would be here after you. And Roy said no. Roy was a very humble person. He said there are far more important people than me to have their name on the side of one of these steam trains. Please don't put my name on them. Respect to Roy's wishes, the number three engine was instead named after Roger Brody. So, how was this one named after Roy? Well, on opening day here at the Magic Kingdom, we only had three trains. The number four was still under refurbishment out of Tampa. It wasn't finished until around Christmas time. Roy passed away on December 20th of 1971. That train arrived here at the Magic Kingdom. Roy wasn't around to tell us no anymore. We put his name on the side of the train. We did this not to spite Roy. We did this to honor him. Because we are 100% certain that if we were to ask Walt whose name should be on the side of this train, keeping in mind everything that Roy did for Walt throughout the course of his life and here at Walt Disney World, we are 100% certain that Walt would have said to put his brother's name up there. Walt would have insisted that we name this train after someone that he loved. One of the reasons why we're so sure about this because that's something that Walt did himself. Walt named trains after people that he loved. His little train that he created with Roger was named after his wife, Lily. He called it the Lily Bell. And that's how we got the name of our number two engine, the Lily Bell. It's named after Lily and Disney. Walt's wife using the same monitor that Walt himself used in his train. So here is a picture of our Lily Bell as well as Lily and Disney. Me a favor, we're gonna have a lot of strollers coming through here, so just make sure we have a pathway open for the strollers to get through. Uh, there's Lily and Disney over there. This is the Lily Bell locomotive. Uh, she is another unique wheel arrangement. She's what we call a mogul style train. So two six two pilot wheels, six drive wheels, no trailing wheels. She is the newest of our steam trains. She was built back in 1928. That's the same year Mickey Mouse was born. Uh, she is also the heaviest of our steam trains. However, she is the lady of the group, so we don't like to tell her that she's the heaviest one. Since she is the heaviest one, though, she is the most powerful. She can pull more than any of the other locomotives. And she is named Lily Bell after Walt's wife, Lily. Walt first met Lily Bowles back in 1924 when she was working as an ink and paint girl at his studio, filling in to color all of the various cells that the animators were producing. Or color or black and white or whatever shading needed to be done. Uh, Lillian and the Ink and Paint Girls would do that. Well, back in the 
he's won on this big tradition. He would take all the ink and paint girls in his car after work and drive them home. Even though Lillian lived closest to the studio, somehow she was always the last one that Walt would drop off. Interesting. Walt wanted to spend as much time as he could before the event. And this does not go unnoticed by the co-founder of the company, Walt's older brother, Roy. Roy says, okay, time to have a conversation with my little brother. So he sits Walt down and says, Walt, you're spending a lot of time with Lillian Bounds. I need to know what are your intentions with her. Walt says that he likes Lillian very much. In fact, Walt says he's going to ask Lillian to marry him. While well, Roy is thrilled by this news. Yes, of course, he's happy for his little brother that he's going to get to marry the girl with his dreams. But remember, Roy was the financial genius behind the company. And Roy had noticed something very unique about Lillian's paychecks. They weren't being cashed. She didn't need to cash them. She came from a well-off family. She was living off of her inheritance. But the paychecks were not being cashed, and this really put Roy into a deep sort of stress, because Roy realized that if those paychecks had been cashed, the company would have gone bankrupt. By not cashing her paychecks, Lillian saved the company. We would not be here today if Lillian had cashed those paychecks. And that was another big reason why Roy was very happy that Lillian was joining the family. He would never have to worry about that money ever again. He always knew where it would be. Walt and Lillian got married on July 13th, 1925. Uh, they had a wonderful relationship with each other. They loved each other very much. They had two wonderful daughters, Diane and Sharon. Uh, Walt loved Lillian a lot. He even named his backyard train after her. We sort of took that name and applied it to our number two engine, the Lillian. Which leaves just one engine left, the number one, named after Walter E. Disney. In case you're wondering what Walt looked like, here he is. This is a picture of Walt Disney, if you've never seen him before. This is the Walter E. Disney steam train, though. Uh, it's similar to the Roger. It is a 10-wheeler style train. It's a 460, a four pilot wheel, zero car, six drive wheels, zero trailing wheels. Uh, built in May 1925 as well, named after Walter E. Disney. We talked about him a little bit earlier. Let's resume his story. The war ends. Walt comes home from the war. He's discovered his new passion for drawing, for art, for animation. He sets up a cartoon studio in Kansas City, Black and Grand Films. Talked about that earlier. That was a complete flop. Meanwhile, Walt's older brother Roy had contracted tuberculosis during the war. The doctors told Roy that the best way to speed up his tuberculosis recovery was to go ahead and move somewhere where he could have an abundance of fresh, cool air that he could breathe. That's exactly what he did. He moved to a part of the country that was, at the time, very well known for its abundance of fresh, clean air. Los Angeles, California. <laughs> very different from the LA we know today. I kind of did actually have clean air in it. So Roy is living out in Southern California in the early 1920s after his brother's cartoon studio has just gone completely bankrupt. Well, what major industry is picking up during this time period? Film. Films. Yeah, Hollywood, the movie-making industry, right? So Roy puts two and two together. He realizes that his brother wants to be in the film industry, but he's out in Kansas City. The film industry is out here in Hollywood, where Roy is. Roy's also got the business sense that Walt doesn't have. He calls up Walt and says, hey, you need to move out here to Hollywood with me. We can go into business together. With your creativity and my financial skills, we can create something special. That's exactly what they did. Walt sold all of his belongings. He bought a one-way train ticket out to Hollywood to move in with his brother. And in 1923, the two of them founded the Disney Brothers Cartoon Studio. Wow. Cartoon Studio would later be renamed Walt Disney Productions, eventually be renamed to what you all have probably heard it as today, the Walt Disney Company. But it didn't start off as a cartoon studio, and it was producing things like the Alice comedies and the Oswald Milwaukee Rabbit cartoons, before going on to do things like the Mickey Mouse cartoons, breaking barriers like sounding cartoons with the Mickey Mouse cartoons and Steamboat Lily, uh, going on to push things like coloring cartoons with flowers and trees and silly symphonies, eventually going on to produce things like Snow White and the Seven Dwarves, the first full-length animated feature film ever made, going on to do bigger and better things like Fantasia, Bambi, Pinocchio, other animated films as well. As you can imagine, the stress of running a cartoon studio really took its toll on Walt. Walt decided that he needed a hobby to go ahead and pass the time. First thing he said, okay, let's try polo. Walt joined a celebrity polo league in Los Angeles, playing polo matches against people like Clark Gable, of all things. Uh, now, Walt wasn't necessarily the best polo player in the world, but he was very enthusiastic. Imagine Walt playing on horseback, swinging a mallet around, right? You can imagine how enthusiastic Walt would have been. 
But something happened to Walt during one of these polo matches that not only would reignite his love of trains, but also change the rest of his life forever. We'll talk about what that is upstairs in the train station. Is everyone okay traveling upstairs, or do we want to take a ramp? Alright. Uh, before we resume the story of... Before we resume the story of Walt Disney, everyone can see, right? Before we resume the story of Walt Disney, uh, let's go ahead and show you where our trains were built. This is the Baltimore Locomotive Works. So this is what it looks like back when our steam trains were built. Uh, this is what it looks like today. It's an empty field with a sign on it that says, Trains used to be built here. <laughs> uh, but it does, this uh, picture here does give you a really good view inside the smoke box on the train. So remember earlier we talked about that honeycomb style pattern? see that here. Those are the flues. That smoke box doesn't have this color on it yet. So you can see the flues that go through the boiler. Also gives you some idea of the size of the steam train. Take a look. This is a boiler. That's a peak. So you can see just how big these steam trains were. Massive. Anyway, what did they look like when we bought them? You probably saw. Yeah, we'll just a little bit. Very nice. You good? You good? This is what they looked like when we bought them. Uh, this is our number one, the Walter E. Disney, number two, the Lily Bell, number three, the Roger E. Brody, we played with this one today, and number four, the Roy O. Disney. Uh, so these are what they looked like when we bought them. Shows you just how much work George Britton had to do, uh, and as well as Roger Brody, to go ahead and take these trains and convert them into the trains that we know today here in the parks. But they're still using 80% original parts, which is just unbelievable. Uh, so, let's go ahead and resume the story of Walt Disney. Uh, earlier we said something happened to Walt during one of these polo matches that would change his life forever. Well, that something was an injury. He took a ball straight to the back of the neck, suffered a completely devastating spinal injury, and had back and neck problems for the remainder of his life. In fact, the doctors said he was very lucky to have survived that injury. But, it did mean that he was never able to play polo again for the rest of his life. So, he had to come up with other new hobbies. Uh, for example, he tried golf. Uh, Walt found golf pretty frustrating. Normally, you like to picture Walt Disney with the personality of Mickey Mouse, right? Well, in this scenario, picture Walt with the personality of Donald Duck. Imagine Donald Duck standing in a sand bunker, just hacking away, sand flying everywhere, the ball staying exactly put. Uh, Walt found golf very frustrating, and she said, okay, you know what? Lawn bowling. Finally, he found something that he liked. He pursued lawn bowling for the rest of his life. As I mentioned earlier, it did leave Walt with some neck, uh, neck, neck and back, there we go, neck and back injuries. Uh, so what happened was, about every afternoon, around 5 o'clock or so, Walt would have the studio nurse, a woman named Hazel George, come up to his office to give him a checkup. She would also give him a massage if he needed to. Now, as you can imagine, she's visiting his office every single day. The two of them become very close friends. They begin to share stories of their childhood with each other. And Hazel notices that one theme seems to pop up in every story from Walt's childhood. What is that? Trains, right? Trains. So, Hazel is giving Walt these checkups every day in the late 1940s. She notices that Walt is beginning to be under a lot of stress from working in the studio, and she tells Walt that he needs to go on a vacation. Right? Hazel actually has the perfect vacation already planned out for Walt. In the Chicago area, in 1948, they were having a railroad fair. A lot of historic uh, locomotives from all eras of rail travel present for you to go ahead and do explore and play Hazel said that Walt should go to the railroad fair. Walt loved this idea, but he said, I can't do that. Lillian hates trains. She would never go with me. Hazel said, no, that's fine. Lillian does not need to go with you. I know someone who will. Someone who has a very strong love of trains as well. She reminded Walt there was an animator in the studio named Ward Kimball. Ward Kimball was another one of Walt Disney's nine old men. He was a character animator, probably best known for Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket was a character that was animated by Ward Kimball. And Ward also really loved trains. Walt said that's a perfect idea. He called up Ward, he didn't even give Ward a choice. He said, Ward, pack your bags in two days and leave Chicago. So the two of them do leave and they travel to the 1948 Chicago Railroad Fair. This railroad fair was set up right along the shore of Lake Michigan. They had a huge stage. You can see these flats set up here as well. Right along the shore, so you can actually see Lake Michigan in the back. They had historic trains there for people to go ahead and explore and play with. One of Walt's favorite things to see was a train called the Old Nashville. Yeah. Anyone ever heard of the Old Nashville before? The Old Nashville is the steam train that pulled the President Abraham Lincoln's funeral procession across the country. Abraham Lincoln was Walt's favorite president. Walt was born in Chicago, right? 
So Abraham Lincoln was his favorite president. Steam train is one of the things that he loves the most. So he gets to combine his passion for two things. Steam trains and American history, Abraham Lincoln, Walt was in heaven. He also enjoyed the show that was put on on this stage. At the conclusion of every show, they had a reenactment of the Golden Spike Track ceremony from Promontory, Utah, which re uh, sort of reunited the uh, east and west coast via the Transcontinental Railroad. Uh, so all of this sort of really appeased Walt and Ward, and when the fair was over for them at least, they did not immediately return to California. Instead, they took a little side trip up to Dearborn, Michigan to visit the museum of Henry Ford. Ford Automobiles, Henry Ford. Henry Ford was a collector of suits. So when you think about people collecting things, you probably think about people collecting things like stamps, or coins, or maybe even Disney pins. Well, Henry Ford didn't collect any of those. Henry Ford was eccentric. He collected historic buildings. Th yeah, things like the bicycle shop where the Wright brothers were working when they invented the airplane. Henry Ford bought it and moved it to his museum in Michigan. Uh, the house that Thomas Edison was living in when he invented the light bulb. Henry Ford bought it and moved it to his museum in Michigan. The courthouse in Illinois where Abraham Lincoln first practiced law. Henry Ford bought it and moved it to his museum in Michigan. So Walter Moore would go up to see this Henry Ford Museum, which he's called Greenfield Village. He's arranged these buildings into a village pattern. Running down the middle of this village is a main street of sorts with period-specific transportation taking guests up and down this main street. Near the back, there was a man-made island that was surrounded by a man-made river. If you wanted to, you could traverse that river in a steamboat. And surrounding the entirety of Greenfield Village was a real working steam train. Does this sound familiar to anyone yet? <laughs> yeah. Uh, this idea sort of nestled its way into Walt's mind, and it never really left. Uh, when he was designing Disneyland many years later, it's hard to imagine he didn't think of the Henry Ford Museum. But anyway, after their visit to the railroad fair and the trains at the Henry Ford Museum, Walt has a big relove of trains. He's right? He's got that passion going again for trains. Ward sort of tells Walt at this point, you know, Walt, I also love trains a lot. In fact, Ward had his own railroad in his backyard. I don't know what is it these people who worked for Walt had trains in their backyard, but Ward's railroad was called the Grizzly Flats Railroad. The railroad might be overstating things. It was 900 feet of track. But they did have two full size steam engines there, which Ward called the Chloe and the Earl of Arm. But with this 900 feet of track, all Ward and his wife could do was pull the train forward and back the train. That was really all they could do, but they loved doing it. In fact, they had friends over to their house for what they called steam up apartments, where they would steam the trains up and everyone would get a turn to operate the train as an engineer. Now, Ward was also a member of a society known as the Los Angeles Live Steamers, which actually still exists to this day. Ward Kimball said, Walt, we're having a steam-up party for the LA Live Steamers at my house soon, why don't you come? So Walt very gleefully gets to go to Ward's house and take part in this steam-up party. For the first time now, since he was a child, 15 years old, he gets to be a mechanic of a real steam train. And Walt is so impressed by what's going on that he also joins the LA Live Steamers. He begins to go to steam parties being held in the homes of other members of the society as well. One of these uh, steam parties at one of these homes really infatuated Walt. This is a party hosted by a man named Dick Jackson. Dick Jackson was known as the Dean of Miniature Live Steam. Because Dick Jackson's railroad, while it was a real steam train, was built at 112th scale. Walt had always loved detailed miniatures growing up. He loved building them, creating them, and playing with them. And now he's got a real working steam train that is in miniature fashion. Walt loved this idea. And this idea gets into Walt's head too. He says, I want to have my own miniature steam train. Walt thought, well, maybe we could have it at the studio. I could take guests on tours of the studio on this miniature steam train wherever they come to visit. So that's when he gets in touch with Roger Brogdon and says, hey, start building me a one eighth scale steam train. Not one twelfth, one eighth. The reason Walt wanted one eighth scale was because he felt one twelfth scale was too small. All the valves and levers coming out of the cab looked too big on you know, a one twelfth scale steam engine. His was going to be one eighth so that everything looked proper. And that's exactly what they did. They built the train, the train at one eighth scale, and on December 24th of 1949, Lily Bell was completed. 
That Christmas Eve night, this photograph was taken inside Soundstage 2 at the Walt Disney Studios. This soundstage, incidentally, is later where Mary Poppins would be filmed. It's now known as the Julie Andrews Soundstage. But it was in this soundstage that Billy Bell was teamed up for the very first time. And just look at the glee on Walt's face as he gets to blow the whistle on his train for the very first time. If you want to see just how incredibly detailed the Lily Bell was, here is her cab. The roof was built on hinges, so it opened up to give the operator a little bit easier control. And take a look. Everything that we see here inside the uh, miniature cab, we saw a full-size version of today. Even down to things like the pressure gauge, the sight glass, the throttle, even a little miniature Johnson bar down there as well. Uh, all of those things were placed there uh, in order to be as authentic as possible. And it was a real working steam train. In fact, here you can see Walt and his daughter filling up the tender of the steam train, utilizing a garden hose. That's how they filled the water in the tender. Uh, well, Walt's idea was to have this at the studio. Turns out, Walt came to his senses and realized if I have this train at the studio, I'm never going to get any work done. I'm going to be playing with this train. So Walt has to begin to search for a new home for his train. Around this time, Walt is beginning to search for a new home for his family as well. He and his wife Lillian get called out to look at a site located at 355 Carrollwood Drive in the Homey Hill section of California. It's a five acre site, it's a beautiful piece of empty land. It starts off on a plateau, looks down into a valley down below. Walt and Lillian are standing up on this plateau, they're both looking out of the valley, and in Walt's mind, he's already planning out his railroad. He's looked down at that valley, he says, that's where the train can go, and he can go there, we can start mapping everything out. He turns to his wife Lillian, he says, Lillian, let's buy this land. Lillian Disney is standing right next to Walt on this plateau. She's looking down into the same valley that he is, and in her mind, she is already planning her massive flower bed that's going to be there. She's going to build a huge picture window in one of her sitting rooms. She can invite all of her friends over to play cards, and have a beautiful view out this picture window. Lillian turns to Walt and says, Walt, I agree. Let's buy this land. So they do. And then they learn why the other one was so keen on buying the land. Walt wants the train. Lillian wants a flower bed, and they sort of back and don't know which one it's going to be. So, Walt did what Disney does best. He got the legal team involved. And he actually had the studio lawyers draw up a real right-of-way contract, probably the only right-of-way contract ever between a husband and a wife, that allowed Walt the right to build his railroad through their property. You can read the full text of the contract online. It's one of the funniest documents I've ever read. And even though it was sort of intended as a joke, it technically was a legally binding contract. Uh, Walt signed on with Diane and Sharon, Walt and Lillian's daughters. Eventually, Lillian did sign on as well, realizing that Walt was going to build his railroad regardless, right? So Walt does go ahead and build the railroad, but he says, you know what, Lillian? I'll give you a little bit of concession. You want that flower bed? You can still have it. We'll give you a big picture window. You can have a flower bed. All your friends come over and have a nice view. What we'll do is we'll build a tunnel underneath the flower bed for the train to go through. And you will never see nor hear that steam train while it's going past that window. So Lillian did end up happy. She got her picture window. And the construction began on Walt's Backyard Railroad at Carrollwood Drive in the late 1940s, early 1950s. Here is that tunnel that was going to go underneath the flower bed. Uh, and here you can see the view from Lillian's picture window looking out at the flower bed. Trains out visible at all, as if you never know there was a train going underneath there if you didn't actually know. Uh, this is the tunnel, though. You may notice the tunnel has a little bit of an S curve to it, an S bend. That was a really late addition to the process. Originally, it was just going to be straight tunnel. At the very last moment, Walt said, Hey, let's put an S curve in. He realized that if you had an S curve in it, you would not be able to see the light at the other end. So for a brief moment, you would be plunged into complete and total darkness giving you a little bit of a thrill as you rode Walt's train. So in a way, this was the first Disney thrill ride, right? Now, when he told the builders that he was going to go ahead and create this S-curve in the tunnel, the builders really sort of scoffed at this and, you know, well, it's going to be a lot more work if you do that. It's going to be a lot more expensive if you do that as well. Walt's response was, more expensive? It'll be, it'll be cheaper, you say, if we don't build the S-curve? It'll be cheaper if we don't build it at all. So please build it with the S-curve. Okay, so they built it with the Esker, and Walt did get the railroad that he wanted. You can see a little bit of it here, too. This massive bridge, part was so big, had to be built in California State Code. One of the huge trestle bridges that ran down in the valley. It was called the Yensid Valley. Kind of catch that significance? Yensid. Disney Valley. Yeah, Disney spelled backwards. Walt liked to sort of do that little backwards, maybe. So he named his valley Yensid Valley. The house was up here on the 
the plateau, down in the valley was his train, and finally, when the construction was completed, on May 7th, 1950, the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad. Here are some pictures of Walt having fun at Carrollwood. You can see him up here on the plateau with his family looking down at the Yensen Valley where his railroad barn was located. The railroad barn was really one of Walt's favorite places to house all of his railroad memorabilia. He could go there and really just escape everything and have a good time. And also had his track switch in there. Uh, so with his track switch, he was able to go ahead and operate the various 12 different switches that he had on his railroad. He was able to configure any configuration that he wanted to. Uh, it also housed uh, things like a sink and a bathroom, so that Walt really would never have to leave if he didn't want to either. As well as a special landline connecting the barn to the home, so if he ever needed to fuck with Lily, he could just pick up that phone, which he would pick up as well. Uh, a few other things that you see here, Walt steaming up the train at Carrollwood. Uh, here's Walt taking around some of the Disney cousins who were visiting Carrollwood that day. They may notice they're all wearing the exact same thing, which apparently was the deal, the big deal at that time. Uh, here's another good picture down here. You can see how much of the track there was down here the, uh, with the house up here on the top. But the track didn't exist just here in the valley, it circled the entire house. Here you can see Walt crossing his driveway. Uh, so even though he may have started with the idea of having it just in the backyard, it did circle the entirety of the Carrollwood property. I'm convinced the only reason that Walt did that was that he would have an excuse to blow the crossing whistle whenever he crossed the driveway. Uh, a few more pictures from Carrollwood over here. Uh, as I mentioned, there were 12 track switches. There was just about 2,600 feet of track. That is half a mile of track in his backyard for the Lily Bell to go around. Uh, Lily Bell could control up to 12 people with 2,000 pounds of tractive power. Uh, you can see here various uh, sort of cars getting set up on the carol with the sort of spur up lines. And you can see back here the barn is open as well. And again, look up here, you can see the whole one. Uh, Walt loved having people over to Carrollwood to see his train and ride his train. But let's talk about the train itself. Boxcars uh, seated? You would sit on top of the boxcars, yeah. So some of the boxcars you would sit on top, some of them were um, sort of open cars that you could sit in as well. But yeah, you were, the idea was that you would ride on those ones. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about the actual train itself. The train, or the engine, and the locomotive were built by Roger and the machine shop out of the studio. All of the passenger cars, or freight cars in this case, were built by the studio prop shop. There was nothing about this train that Walt could call his very own. So he wanted to build something that he could say, I did. I did that. So there's only one bit of the train left. Which bit of the train is that? The caboose, yeah. So Walt built his very own little yellow caboose. This was entirely built by Walt, and it was his pride and joy. Remember how earlier I said Walt loved detailed miniatures? He took that to the extreme here with his caboose. The roof was on hinges, so you could open up and see everything that Walt put inside. Things like a real wood burning stove for a little imaginary conductor. If he ever got cold, he could go ahead and make a fire. Uh, maybe he would get bored, so he could read magazines or newspapers with real miniature prints on them as well. Maybe he wanted some fresh air. He could turn this real working doorknob and open up that door to get fresh air in that caboose as well. Walt loved this caboose. You can see him showing it off to people who came to visit Carolwood. He loved the caboose so much that the caboose and the Lily Bell itself were the only things that were locked in the barn at the end of the day. All of the passenger cars were kept in the flower bed tunnel. Uh, the caboose and the Lily Bell were locked up in the barn in order to make sure that nothing bad ever happened. Now, earlier I said 2,600 feet of track, half a mile. I can say that all I want, but you really can't appreciate the scope of Walt's backyard railroad until you see the full map view of it. So take a look at the full plan of the Carolwood Pacific Railroad. Huge. Here's Walt's very small house up here, right on the hill. Uh, the garage and the pool are up here. Down here in Yensen Valley is where the majority of the track is located. The barn is here. You can see a tunnel here, then the S tunnel up here. Uh, and then you can see it follows all the way around in circles in front of the driveway as well. Here's the street back here. Uh, while it is true that Lily, looking out of that picture window, never had to see nor hear the train, what she did oftentimes see was a complete stranger walking through her backyard, usually led by Walt Disney, because Walt wanted to fire up his train. When he would do this, he would basically go stand out on the street corner and say, Hey, anyone here want to ride my train? Of course, the neighborhood children were not going to turn down a free ride on Walt Disney's personal train. Hosting steam up parties of his very own at Carol. Yes.
capable of killing people. Yeah. Yes. Uh, did any incident happen or accident or something? Yes, I'm gonna get to that in just a second. Yes. Yeah. Um, Walt began hosting steam up parties. Oh, hi Roger. Walt began hosting steam up parties and he invited all of his family and friends every Sunday to come down to Carol. Uh, so here are some photos from the steam up parties. And down here you can see Walt sort of showing off the train and it's wonderful plaid shirt down there. Uh, here you can see Walt and Roger getting ready to steam the train up and then my favorite photograph, one of my favorite photographs of all time. Uh, this photograph taken uh, during a steam up party in Carrollwood. That is the Lily Bell in Walt's backyard. Operating the Lily Bell is Ward Kimball. Riding on the train is Spanish surrealist painter Salvador Dali. And if you want to talk about surrealism, it doesn't get any more surreal than that. That is Walt Disney's miniature steam train in his backyard being operated by the guy that drew Jiminy Cricket pulling the guy who painted the melting clocks. <laughs> who else but Walt Disney could make that happen, right? Uh, Walt loved having these steam-up parties, but as you mentioned, something did happen in one of these steam-up parties in 1953. There was a guest engineer on the Holy Bell who ended up taking a turn a little bit too quickly, derailed the train. Not that big of a deal in all actuality. Walt himself even made that mistake a few times. But when the train's laying on the side, that train steam begins to escape in every which way. This little girl who was at the steam party was very curious, walked over towards that overturned engine. When she got close enough, sure enough, an invisible jet of steam came out and gave her a small burn on her leg. Not that serious of an injury, she wasn't hurt too badly, but this devastated Walt. Walt said, how could something that gave him so much joy cause pain to someone else? And from that day on, he never ran the Carrollwood Pacific Railroad uh, ever again. But trains were not dead to Walt Disney. Walt had already begun thinking up the ideas for Disney. And he knew that he was going to have trains out at Disney. And he realized, I can operate these trains whenever I want to. He's going to go ahead and proceed building the Disneyland Railroad. And then all of a sudden, he realizes, whoa, maybe I can't operate these trains whenever I want to. See, Walt Disney Productions was a publicly owned company. If the shareholders didn't like the idea, for whatever reason, of Walt operating these trains, Walt did not want to be told no. So what he did is he created his own separate company called Red Law. It's Walter spelled backwards. Red Law is the private holdings company for the Disney family. It still exists to this day. And in the 1950s, they owned several Disneyland attractions including the Disneyland Railroad. Which meant that if you worked on the Disneyland Railroad, you did not work for Disneyland. You worked for Walt himself. Every Thursday when you got your paycheck, it was personally signed by Walt Disney himself. Led to one of the most prestigious positions out at Disneyland, working for the railroad. Even though the railroad is now owned by the Walt Disney Company, not Retlaw, it still is considered one of those most prestigious positions because of its history, and it sort of transmits over here to the Walt Disney World Railroad as well. It's a position that Walt loved so much. In fact, he loved it so much that he would operate these trains any time he could. Has anyone, has anyone ever seen the Disneyland opening day special? Uh, you, can, you can see the full thing on YouTube. What? Who said that? That's <laughs> so strange. Uh, but if you watch the full thing, you see that it's not even hosted by Walt. It's hosted by three other individuals, and Walt doesn't even show up until about ten minutes in. How do you think Walt arrives at Disneyland? Train. Operating the train. He shows up at Disneyland the very first day it's ever going to be opening, operating the train. That's how much Walt cared about these trains. As you mentioned, he oversaw the creation of the Disneyland Railroad with the first two engines, the CK Holiday and the EP Ripley. These were named after Santa Fe Railroad executives, because Santa Fe is the title sponsor of the Disneyland Railroad. They held that sponsorship all the way up to the 1970s. So when we added to the Disneyland Railroad with those two new trains in 1958, we named them again after Santa Fe executives. Number three is the Fred Gurley, number four is the Ernest S. Marsh. Number five train at Disneyland was added in 2005, and that's well after Santa Fe, and so we were able to go ahead and have a more Disney name for that locomotive. The fifth locomotive is named the Ward Kimball. So Ward Kimball is the only sort of Disney name on one of the Disneyland railroads. Uh, we sort of redid that tradition here at Walt Disney World, and we talked all morning about our locomotives, right? You know the four names of ours. But it's not just Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom that has trains here as well. Other Magic Kingdom style parks around the world have them too. Over at Tokyo Disneyland, they have a steam train there too. But it's a little bit different than the one that we have here. 
It does not circle the entire park with multiple stops, thanks to laws in Japan. There are laws in Japan that say if that train has more than one stop, it's technically transportation, not an attraction, which means two things. Number one, we have to pay additional taxes on it. Number two, we would have to charge our guests every time they wanted to ride it. We said, nah, we're not about doing that. So we created a different style railroad. It circles the western half of the park and it only has that one stop. So you take the grand circle tour of the western half of the park and then you get off the train. Over at Disneyland Paris, we were able to build the more traditional railroad format. So their steam trains at Disneyland Paris, a little bit more like what we have here at Magic Kingdom and at Disneyland as well. Multiple stops around the park. Same thing out at Hong Kong Disneyland, except there were regulations in Hong Kong saying that we could not actually build a steam train. So instead, we built an electric train that looks like a steam train, but it does not operate around the park. Uh, just some more regulations in China at the time, so we couldn't do that. Those regulations probably only got even more intense because Shanghai Disneyland actually does not have a train at all that circles the park or any part of it. But there's a lot of railroad imagery that is still present in Shanghai Disneyland, specifically on their version of Main Street USA, which we call Mickey Avenue. You enter the park, again, still through a train station, so there's still a train station there with a lot of train imagery, including some pictures of Walt and Carol that you would see there. And their 3 o'clock afternoon parade, it's themed to trains. So it's like a giant train coming down to Seattle. Uh, so there are trains present really in every Disneyland-style park around the world. I think it's safe to say that we can even build a Disneyland on the moon one day, and there would still be a train somewhere in that park, right? Uh, trains are present all over the place. You mentioned that you yes. were operated Yes. Uh, he basically sent the train to the studio and it was put in a box. His family still owns the train. We're going to talk about it just a second where you might see that train today. Um, the tracks at Carrollwood were sort of left in disrepair. He did maintain his barn though. Um, and a lot of that actually still exists today. The home does not. Uh, the home was torn down uh, and along with it, the barn was getting ready to be torn down. Until at the very last moment, a man named Michael Brogy came It's Roger Brogy's son. When Michael Brogy was about 12 years old, he actually worked at some of these steam-up parties for Walt. He had a very thorough knowledge of Carol. And when he realized that this barn was about to be torn down in the late 1990s, after Willie and Disney passed away, he made an agreement with the new owner of the home that he could get in there first and remove the barn piece by piece. And that's exactly what he did. He ended up donating the barn to the Los Angeles Live Steamers. It is now set up for you to visit in Griffith Park in California, which is, an area, and there's an area in Griffith Park that is operated by the LA Live Steamers to this day. And you can visit, there we go, Waltz Railroad Barn for yourself. It is open on the third Sunday of every month for free. Uh, out at Griffith Park for you to go ahead and enjoy it. It is kept exactly the same way that Walt had it built way back, all the way still there as well. Uh, a lot of Walt's railroad memorabilia is there for you to see too. They've even built this barn in the same north-south orientation that it was out at Carrollwood. So the light hits it the same way. And not only that, they put the same types of plants around it as well. Now it may look a little different down here because these plants are a lot younger, but take a look. Orange tree, orange tree. Eventually, one day, it will look just like it did out at Carrollwood, uh, minus, of course, the home being up here on the hill and the actual railroad itself going around. There's a lot of Walt's railroad memorabilia inside, including one car from the Carrollwood District Railroad. So you can see that there if you visit the railroad car. Most of the rest of the train is located at the Walt Disney Family Museum in San Francisco. So if you want to still see the Lily Bell, the rest of the passenger, or most of the passenger cars, and Walt's caboose, they are on display in San Francisco at the Walt Disney Family Museum, which is owned and operated by the Walt Disney Family themselves. If you want to see a little bit of the train here at Walt Disney World, you're in luck. We're actually pretty close to another bit of the Carol Pacific Road. It's not here at the Magic Kingdom, but it's not far. Over at the Wilderness Lodge Villas, there is a room off the main entryway in the Villas building called the Carolwood Room, and that is, hands down, my favorite room at Walt Disney World. There's a lot of train memorabilia in there, a lot of Walt memorabilia in there as well, including, underneath some glass, two cars from the Carolwood Pacific Railroad. Uh, these two cars, we can therefore say, are some of the only things here at Walt Disney World that Walt himself actually touched, uh, because we have those out on display for people to go ahead and see. That's how we're at the Wilderness Lodge Buildings in the Carolwood Room. Before we go, there's one last picture I want to show you. It is, hands down, my favorite picture on the entire tour. Here is Walt 
is the standing in front of the Lily Bell. That's not our Lily Bell, though. That is Walt's Lily Bell. The small one-eighth scale frame. This is Photoshop before Photoshop. This photograph was done as sort of a gift to Walt by his imaginators, people responsible for building everything in the parks, because they knew how much this train meant to Walt. This photograph of Walt was taken by Roger Brody at a steam up party. The Imagineers then took this train, Walt's train, put it in the same lighting conditions as Walt was in that photograph, and used an extreme close-up lens to take a photograph of Walt's lily bell. They then scaled the two photographs and put them together in such a way that if Walt's train were a full-size steam train, this is what Walt would look like standing in front of it. A few things to note about this photograph. Number one, the incredible detail that Walt and Roger put into the living room. Things like the rivets here on the smoke box on the stack. Remember, this is a one-eighth scale train. It's only about this big. Look at the detail on the headlamp, on that nature painting on the side of the headlamp. Incredible detail work there. Yeah. Yeah. And Walt smile. I promise he's smiling. And that is actually the last thing I want to point out to you. The most important thing about this photograph is Walt himself. Take a look at that smile that Walt has on his face. Think about every other photograph that you've seen of Walt Disney. Usually he is smiling, yes, but it's usually that I'm taking a picture so I'm going to smile, smile. Is that that forced picture smile? No. That is the smile of someone who is having fun, playing with the trains, doing what he loves. That's why trains are so important to us. Trains were Walt's escape. When Walt was playing with the trains, he did not have any of the pressures of the real world on him. He was not Walt Disney the medium owner. He was just Walt. The same way that we feel whenever we set foot into one of our parks, right? We are relieved of all the pressures of the outside world and we are kids at heart. In a way, the trains were to Walt what the parks, the Magic Kingdom, Disneyland is to us. That's why we continue to do all of these things and to have these trains here because they were so important to the man who gave all of this to us. And just as this was a gift for Walt, I have a gift for you all as well. We're coming along with me on the tour today. You all will be taking home with you a very special, exclusive Disney's The Magic Behind Our Steam Trains tour and mounted on a very special car as well. And as you can imagine, there's a little bit of story behind this pin, which by the way, incidentally, is the most expensive pin you will ever have. Uh, the tour was free, it was the pins that you were paying for. So please do not trade away these pins, it is the most expensive pin you will ever have. And there's a little bit of a story behind these pins, as well as the card that they're mounted on. On the card itself, is the train that we spent all day with, the Roger E. Brody, your number three engine. On the pin, the number one engine, all three Disney. Operating that engine, Mickey Mouse. In a way, the three most important people to our railroad here at Walt Disney World. Roger, the person who built the railroad. Walt, the person he built it for. Mickey Mouse, the living embodiment today of Walt Disney, responsible for keeping dreams on track, as we saw in that window outside the park. But to be honest with you, we could come up with a cutesy story for just about any combination of trains that we put here under these spins. Why did we choose the Walter and the Roger to put here? Think back this morning at the roundhouse. We looked at the serial number of the Roger, 58445. If we were to look at Walter's manufacturer's plate, its serial number is 58444. Consecutive serial numbers. What that means is that these two trains were built side by side, together, in the shop out at Baldwin in Philadelphia. They were both bought together by the United Railways and Yucatan, sent to Mexico together. They worked side by side for 40 years, hauling rope and fiber up and down the peninsula. Somehow they both got sent together to that bone yard where together they were discovered by Roger and Irma, who bought them both, shipped them both together to Tampa, where George Britton oversaw the refurbishment of the two trains, and still to this day, they are working together, side by side, here at the Magic Kingdom. This is the oldest example anywhere in the world that we can find of two brother trains still in operation today, having never been apart from each other. 
Believe me, we've tried to find other examples. This is the oldest one we can find. That is just one more reason why there truly is magic behind our steam trains. So these pins are for you. And with that, the tour is officially over. Did you all have fun today? Oh my gosh, fresh baked. Was that cool or was that cool? And look at the pin. Look at the pin, look at the pin. The magic behind our steam trains tour. You guys, I never would have expected just how much magic there was. <laughs> I'm a little choked up. Um, that was that was really magical. Uh, whew, all right, uh, Walt. <laughs> That was awesome, hearing hearing that story and just seeing the joy and, and the, his dream come true. I mean, look, look what we get to enjoy because of his dream and because of those trains. Super awesome, you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, thank you, thank you so much to all, all of my patrons, patrons through uh, Patreon. Love you guys, appreciate the support. It's amazing. Hopefully I get to show you many, many more tours and amazing stuff just like that. 